This is my father's world, and to my listening ear, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. Our first song, song 92, this is my father's world. This is my father's world, and to my joy below. Two, five, three. There's no other name like Jesus. Stands as one, three, and five. I 
On Christ the solid rock I stand. Stand, 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 stand. That was a lovely song service. Just, just the thing that we would need to get ourselves back in the frame of mind for a fresh 2022. Now, we are going to go into our afternoon segment and we have several presentations. And the first one, I am going to introduce our presenter for the next few minutes. Our presenter is Dr. Roy R. Dennis. Now, he's an ordained pastor who has been ministering as a pastor for over 24 years, and he has pastored more than 30 churches. What academically he has prepared for this, this role and this 24-year ministry with a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology from NCU. Also from NCU, he has earned a Master of Science degree in counseling and psychology with an emphasis in family therapy. He went on to the Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, where he earned a Doctor of Ministry. And you know, as the Bible shows us that our, our faith is shown in what we do, you know, our, our faith must be shown out. Dr. Dennis has many civic appointments. He is a marriage officer of the island of Jamaica. He's a volunteer police chaplain. He's a justice of the peace. He's a member of the Jamaica Psychological Society. He's a licensed associate psychologist with the Council for Professionals Allied to Medicine. He's a certified clinical supervisor for the Jamaica Psychological Society and NCU. He's a member of the St. Catherine the Child Diversion Committee. He's a certified preparer and enrich facilitator. He's also an international affiliate member of the American Psychological Association. Between 2010 and 2021, he served the Central Jamaica Conference in various capacities, including Family Ministries and Counseling Services Director, Stewardship Director, and Health Ministries Director. And as of this year, January 1, 2022, he has been elected to serve as Family Ministries, Men's Ministries, Stewardship and Trust Services Director for Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He has hosted numerous radio programs, including Morning Manor, which airs on Love 101, and the program Lifeline aired on NCUFM. And presently, he contributes to the program Family Guide on NCUFM. Family is a big deal for Dr. Dennis, and uh, his, he's married to Keisha, and she's a trained teacher and librarian, certified preparer and enriched facilitator. She is also the acting vice principal at the Jose Marti Technical High School. 
and their union has produced three children, Roshan, Rahim, and Raya. And Roshan is a second year student at NCU. Dr. Dennis will be handling for us and leading us through the very weighty topic of divorce and remarriage. And without any further words from me or interruptions, Dr. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Theodore. And um, for a well done introduction, I would like you to introduce me all the time. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Thanks to you, Pastor Chambers, the point person and the religion and theology department at Northern Caribbean University, as well as the Ministerial Association for the invitation to share. It's my honor to share noble budding ministers in the Ministerial Association. These individuals who will, in the next years to come, uh, be sitting in my seat and pastoring some of the churches that I have pastored in Jamaica. And also, I want to bring you greetings, first and foremost, from the uh, Jamaica Union Conference, or President Pastor Everett Brown, the administration, directorate and staff at Jamaica Union Conference. I bring you greetings on behalf of my wife and family. Uh, my wife and I have had the privilege of being trained uh, at Northern Caribbean University. I have been trained as a pastor and a psychologist there, and my wife as a trained teacher. And so we are honored to serve Northern Caribbean University. I thank her and my family for their continued support. And now, as I address this topic, I don't remember being given the time that I have, Pastor Chambers, normally when I'm not given the time, I take a hour. So, so I'm, going to, I'm going to time myself for two, um, 3.26. Um, I see 45 minutes there. So um, not having the time before, I'll try to keep within it but I, I didn't get the time before, so it is geared for a hour. I'm going to try to work with the 45 minutes. So let us get into the presentation. Then I will be sharing my screen um, with you at this time as we get into this very, very important topic. Okay. 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 The biblical and ecclesiastical perspective on divorce and remarriage. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to join with the Ministerial Association at Northern Caribbean University. Ask that you will guide in our deliberations at this time that your word will have an imprint on their hearts, that they will be guided by your word, your principles and your standard, even as they seek to be the vanguard to keep the law and to guide the church into your holy standards. Use me as your instrument to lift these young men higher. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that all of us on the various platforms will be blessed as we go through this topic in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So uh, some time ago, a young man walked into my office while I was serving in a particular district. And uh, before he could sit down in his distress, almost at tears, he asked me, he said, Pastor, can you tell me what is the process to get a divorce? How can I get a divorce? <laughs> to which I jokingly said to him, Sir, I am a marriage officer. I join people together. I don't separate. However, you know, seeing the distress, I had to spend some time with him to hear what he had to say. And every pastor needs to be equipped in counseling skills because that is a great need um, 
in the field. So I had to spend time with him to go through the challenges that he was faced with and his wife having migrated and he not able to get a visa and, and now the marriage was about to be destroyed. In the sinful world that we are, we are amidst all the attempts that are made, just like the seeds that are scattered and some will be on good ground and some on thorny ground and so on. We have found that there are so many things that may affect marriages and some of these marriages will end due to unfaithfulness, due to abandonment, due to migration, due to domestic violence and due to numerous and varied circumstances um, that influences the marriage. When all of this is being said, we need to bear in mind that divorce is contrary to the plan of God. And the, 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 the Dr. Clegon would refer to this text as the pericope upon which uh, Adventists would base their beliefs, even though we use other texts. And also the foundation for the presentation today is uh, Matthew chapter 19, and I'm going to read from verses 3 to 8. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 8. And this is what the Bible says here. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. He made them male and female. And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. But therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They said unto him, why did Moses then command to give the writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses said out of their heart, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered, hearts suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. From the beginning. It was not so. So um, this is one of the texts that the Adventists will emphasize a lot. And one of the main reasons is because the statements that we have there, they are coming directly from Jesus Christ. Now, not every case of divorce uh, makes it eligible, even though we said that there are situations where people, marriages will break down and people will end up in divorce. But one of the key pointers that we have to bear in mind is that not every case of divorce makes it eligible for remarriage. And so you will ask, so what are the cases under which the Seventh-day Adventist Church says that a divorcee may remarry? And right up top, we will say from uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus made it clear and he says, whosoever shall put away his wife except for fornication and shall marry another committed adultery. In other words, there is one reason that Jesus mentioned fornication, except for fornication, he says committed adultery. Now, I want to spend a little time, short time that I have, but I, I think that this text helps us. Uh, to understand why Jesus used the term fornication. I use it in every premarital, with, with every couple I prepare for marriage. This is the foundational text that we use. And, and because of time, I'm not going to read all of it. But, but um, you, you, I wanted to read from verses 18, um, from verse 18, and that is Genesis chapter, chapter uh, 2 and verse 18. So Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 to 20, I think it's 24. Let me just check. Uh, um, Genesis chapter 2 and verses 18 to 24. There's no 25. I don't know how uh, um, that uh, online source 
it says 24 to 25, um, but there is no 25. I just copied this thing and, and I have to change that slide there. But um, as a theologian, I should know that there is no 25. But verse 24 is the verse. That, um, so, so, sorry, Genesis chapter 2 and verse um, and the wrong chapter. Yes, there's a 25. All right, so it's correct. Verse 24 and 25. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. All right, so it's two verses that are there. All right, so I, I wanted verse 24, but we have the two last verses there. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's the verse I want you to concentrate on. Now, this is the verse that helps us to understand what Jesus says. What does this one fleshness mean? That's what I ask couples as we prepare them for marriage. What does this one fleshness mean? And many times they talk about the unity between the husband and the wife, unit financial, they must be one together, communication, they must be one together, um, family worship, they must be one together. That's the application to the text. And if, you're, if you talk about biblical interpretation, then you're going to know that there are some texts that are prof prophetic and there are some, and, and so you have to look at the history, you have to look at the context of the text, and you have to look at whether it's literal or prophetic and so on. This was a literal text to the point where Seventh-day Adventists will say it is seven literal days and not symbolic like some persons would want and would say that when God says it is good, God was speaking literally and, and so on. And so when we come down to this text, this past, this verse, I am saying too, the first thing is that you need to look at the literal application. And the word that gives us the practical, literal application is the word flesh. That is talking about a man and a woman coming together in intercourse. This is the deepest level of intimacy that one can find on earth, where a man and a woman would come together, the man, and they would have intercourse to the point where body is inserted into the other person's body. There is no other relationship on earth that can come as close as that. So intercourse is the sealing of the marriage contract from the foundation. And it is so today. Um, I look at, I, I spent some time looking at the Hebrew marriages and, and one Bible scholar says that when the marriage ceremony was performed, there was an upper room that the couple would go and they would have intercourse. And, you know, and, and, and so that's a couple now getting married for the first time, first marriage. And they would come out with the sheep with the blood to prove that they are virgins. And, 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 you, and, and you should know, um, when we did the course health education, we were told that virgins, both male and female, will expel blood. And that is the seal. Every contract in Old Testament time was sealed by blood. This was like dipping the pen in the blood, the ink made of blood and sealing the contract. So Jesus is saying that the contract is sealed by blood. The RGD, which is not a church institution, acknowledges that the contract is not only sealed by the wedding band or by the vows at the marriage ceremony, but, but they allow for one year for the couple to go and to have intercourse to prove that they have a sex organ. And that if, if they don't have a sex organ, the marriage can be annulled. RGD taught us that. And that, and that is the only way that the marriage can be annulled is if they don't have a sex organ. So even the RGD recognizes that intercourse is the sealing of the marriage contract. It is the only thing that you should not share with anybody else. So, so Jesus is saying the marriage is sealed not only by prayer and the wedding ban and the signing of the legal contract, it is sealed by sexual intercourse. And, it is the, and so if you seal it through sexual intercourse and you go to have intercourse with somebody else, you would have breached the marriage contract. So that is why Jesus used the term fornication. I hope you have a clearer understanding of that. So uh, let's look at the matter of divorce. Um, so, so divorce is seen here by 
these two authors, uh, Horner, and uh, that is Bob and Jan Horner, that divorce is a legal termination of a once promising relationship that has been coming apart socially and emotionally. So people don't just get up and divorce. The relationship, it was getting bad and then it's getting worse and simple things can cause your relationship to deteriorate to the point where it reaches divorce. And there are persons with major problems who could resolve those and remain together. And there, I have seen persons with simple challenges because they are unable to resolve them that has become a mountain to destroy their relationship. One, I, one of the things I can tell you as young ministers, budding pastors, is that there are pastors who are ending up in separation and divorce because of pride. Sometimes in your marriage and your relationship, when you are unable to resolve your conflicts, you need somebody else to help you and to see things better and to see things from another person's perspective. And, and, and sometimes we allow pride to destroy our relationship. And don't think that because you're a holy man, because you're a pastor, that you are immune. So, 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 so divorce, the relationship would have been falling apart. Listen to what um, this Adventist um, divorce and remarriage um, uh, and its impact on the Seventh-day Adventist church um, survey has, has outlined that legally divorce, it says legally divorce is, a, is not, is a single event, but socially, emotionally, and psychologically, it is a chain of events Re relocation and radically changed relationship that results in a broken family, changed lifestyle, economic hardship, and a series of trans tr transitions that challenges, disrupt, modify the lives of individuals, promoting growth for some. Some people, they are being stifled in their marriage and when they divorce, uh, it promotes growth for them. And for others, it, it exposes them to vulnerabilities um, that can be devastating and destructive. All right. So that that is uh, what the survey found. Um, so the effects of divorce. The effects of divorce is similar to death, and in some cases it can be worse because when you have a loved one who has died and you bury them, lay them in the grave. Uh, over time, you come to acceptance, and the goal of grief is to reach acceptance. It, it, it's dubbed that disbelief, anger, bargaining, uh, distress, and then acceptance. And these are the same symptoms that people go through when they are going through divorce, like when there is a death, uh, the loss of a loved one. But sometimes, when you have a death in the family, after you bury the person and you see them go in the grave, you know they are dead. And then they won't be able to come back to haunt you or to trouble you. But when it relates to divorce, sometimes the people who, when the relationship has died, then you have custody cases. Then you have the person haunting you and attacking you in various ways. Then you have the separation of property. And so sometimes the, the misery and the hatred and the distress uh, continues to haunt you for the rest of your life. So there is emotional shock, there is anger, there is loneliness, there is unhappiness, there is self-blame and grief and sometimes suicidal ideation, antisocial behavior and regression in children, difficulty moving on in life, inability to trust another person and to form intimate relationships in the future. And from time to time, from the time the divorce happens through to the recovery, we are told involve seven stages, which for some, there are some people will say there are five st stages for grief, and there are others who will say that there are seven st stages. The same Cobbler Ross who gave us five stages came back and gave us seven stages. And these are the seven stages that people go through when they divorce denial, shock, and denial, and anger, and bargaining, and depression, and acceptance, and rebuilding their lives. So, so you see that divorce is like death or in some cases worse than death. So divorce in the Seventh-day Adventist church, what is it like? Well, this is a long time research. Um, I have not found any recent ones, but what it said at the time is that as the, the researchers in the Adventist church, the general conference looked around the world, 
the average divorce rates around the world were from 10% on a low in any country to 28% on a high. Um, in the United States, uh, there were, it was said that there were, um, you know, some persons, uh, first marriages um, by 2000 were ending up 50%. But this is what the Adventist church found, 10 to 28%. For that same period, let's see how the, 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 the so divorce rate, the Adventists reporting that they experienced. So 10 to 28% rather in the Adventist church. Pardon me. That was what the Adventist church found, that the highest level in the Adventist church were about 28%. And the, at the, on a low in any country, it would be about 10%. In countries now, you would have higher rates of divorce and possibly lower rates in some countries. Um, for example, in Jamaica, in the same period, you will look back at the uh, statistics for Jamaica during the same period, and divorce was, was less than 10% um, during that same period. But it was about 50% in the United States um, for first marriages and 65% for second marriages and so on. So what it says, these statistics tells us that back then, because we cannot use that to generalize for today because it's 1997 to 1999, um, back then, that divorce rate in the Seventh-day Adventist church was lower than the rate on a national scale. And the studies have shown generally recently too that those who have a, a Christian values and principles are less likely to become divorced than those who are without these values and principles. So studies continue to show that religious values and experience keep people together longer and helps to build stronger relationships but it does not make you immune. Causes of, for divorce, marrying for the wrong reason, uh, experiment rather than stability, uh, lack of trust and commitment, lack of intimacy, and so on. Uh, how to rebuild your marriage to prevent divorce, love your spouse in the way they want to be loved, take care of your appearance, be faithful to your spouse, uh, do things together. Uh, and as, as a pastor psychologist, one of the things that I've seen is that there are, there are many um, ministerial families that are affected by the same thing, including infidelity, um, just like out there in the world. And I'm saying now, Seventh-day Adventist pastors now need to ensure that you are committed to the principles and standards that you teach, right? Say, I love you every day. Um, don't just love the Bible. When you marry a woman, you marry a woman. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear that you can't live like a single man when you're married. You have obligation and responsibility to your spouse. You can't just do crusades and, 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 and not mindful of your wife and your children. Uh, you need to ensure that they are given proper and quality time because when your wife leaves you, it, your ministry will take a hit. So you need to make the investment in your ministry but you also need to bear in mind that quality investment must be made in your family. So let's go to the meat of the matter, what you want to hear um, with the next 15 minutes to go. The meat of the matter, what you want to hear. Biblical teachings on marriage. What does the Bible say about marriage? So three things we're going to tie up this presentation with. The biblical teachings on marriage. We're going to look at the biblical teachings of divorce. And then we are going to look at the church's perspective of divorce and remarriage. Right? So the origin of marriage. The Bible talks about the origin of marriage. I have read several books about um, some people even refuting the flood. And there are persons who refute creation. And then, so we have evolution and we have, um, and so on. But I have not seen any book or heard of any theory that tells us where the first couple comes from, except the Bible creation story that says God created Adam and Eve. There might be other stories out there, but I'm saying I have not seen it. I have not read it, right? So the origin of man, the Bible says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that God created male and female, and that is significant. And so God created them. So the origin of the marriage starts with God. Where God created man, and then we touch on the text, verse Genesis 2, 24, where God joined them together and says that they should become one flesh. Thus, God celebrated the first marriage. 
Uh, thus, the institution has for its originator, the creator of the universe. Marriage is honorable. It was one of the first gift of God to man. And it is one of the two institutions that after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. So it was God who created marriage and gave man his wife as a gift and gave the woman her husband as a gift. He was the first marriage officer. It began with God. The second thing principle from the Bible is that is oneness. The Bible says God created male and female in his own image. And God took the rib from the man's side to demonstrate that they must walk as partners. When the Bible says God created a help meet for him, some translation will say God created a partner for, for, for him. And I asked them in premarital counsel, who is the partner? And, 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 and most times, the, both the male and the female will say the woman is the partner. Who is the helper? And both male and the female will say, oh, the woman is the helper. But if the, the fact is, God could have created any one of them first. And, 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 and if God created a partner for the man, it means that the man should be a partner to the woman. So they are equal, they are co-partners. They might have differences of personality, uh, differences in sexes and differences in terms of how they use their brain. The woman use the right side more, the man use the left side more and so on. Difference in terms of emotion, the man is more physical, the woman is more emotional, but God made them for complementarity that the right side of the brain will complement the left side of the brain and that the, the penis, which is external, will complement the vagina, which is to uh, prepare to receive it. So, 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 um, so God um, made Adam and Eve as co-equal and they, they are one in mind. Differences of responsibility, but they are one they should work together to create a happy home the next thing is permanence marriage is lifelong commitment of the husband and wife right to each other that is what the bible says so so you can read those texts mark 10 uh, 2 to 9 and romans 7 verse 2 and you know these principles so i don't have to spend the whole afternoon explaining them uh, ephesians 5 and and i would say read verse 21 from Ephesians 5, um, where, where it talks about submitting uh, to one another, and then verse 31 and 32, where it indicates the permanence of the marital relationship. So it's a lifelong commitment that you make. Sexual intimacy in marriage, within marriage, is, sac is a sacred gift from God to human family. This is the only place in which sexual intimacy should take place. That's what the Bible teach about sexual intimacy, that, that God gave the man his wife and God gave them sexual intimacy for bonding, for procreation, and for, uh, I'm going to use a term from my wife now, for recreation. So this is, um, this is why God created it. And as I told you before, this is the only thing that is used as a ceiling of the contract. And if it is given and utilized outside of this context, then Jesus says you would have breached the marital contract. Then there is partnership in marriage. Unity in marriage is to be achieved by mutual respect and love. So um, Ephesians 5, 21 to 28, Genesis um, 6, 11, and so on. Uh, unity in marriage and partnership. So neither, Ellen White says in Testimonies, volume 7, verses page 47, neither the husband nor the wife is to make a plea for rulership. The Lord has laid down the principle that is to guide in this matter. The husband is to cherish his wife as Christ cherishes the church, and the wife is to respect and love her husband. Both are to cultivate a spirit of kindness, being determined never to give or injure, to grieve or injure the other. So this is the love and the care and the concern that she, we should have for one another, not to grieve one another. 
So the effects of the fall is another biblical principle that we see that affects the marriage, that the entrance of sin adversely affects the marriage. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost oneness and they, that they had known with God and with one another. The first thing we see is that they start blaming one another. They start blaming one another. And the, the man says, it's the woman that you gave me. And the woman says that it's the serpent that you made. And uh, the, the, the woman says, it's the serpent that you made. And the man says, it's the woman that you gave me. And ultimately, they start blaming one another. Later on, we see that there was violence in the home and the family where Cain killed his own brother, uh, Abel. And the whole creation groans as a result of the fall. The same way that as a result of man's fall and man's sin, God stepped in, took the fig leaves from man, uh, killed an animal, a clean animal, which the blood was pointing to the blood of Jesus and uh, gave them the, 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 the skin of this animal for covering uh, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And this brought about restoration and healing when you have difficulties in your marital relationship, there must be restoration and healing and restoration. The, and I normally say the person you are going to need to forgive the most is the person that is closest to you. There are people out there at church that you don't have any business relating to because you don't have any close relationship to them. And you, and you may not have to forgive them for anything. But the more time you're going to spend with your wife and your husband, you're going to find that if the relationship is going to work, that people might be good, but people are not perfect and they will make mistakes. And anytime you can forgive one particular mistake, your relationship is already over. Right, so restoration and healing is a part of his grace, um, must be administered. Biblical teachings of divorce. What does the Bible teach about divorce? Not much, I'm going to say here, um, because of time. But the Bible teaches, one of the main things that the Bible teaches is that divorce is contrary to the plan of God. In Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 3 to 8, the passage that that uh, the passage I wasn't having that feedback. I don't know why suddenly that feedback is there. So um, the passage, the passage that we're focusing on, Matthew chapter nineteen, verses three to eight. Jesus says, "From the beginning, it was not so." And then he says, "Moses told them to write this divorce because of the hardness of their heart." I don't have the time to read the passage, so I'm going to tell you this is a key passage for you to read. Two passages you need to read uh, from, um, as you try to understand this matter of divorce and what the Bible says about divorce. You, you will see on the screen several passages that you can choose from, but there are two key passages here. Matthew 19 verses 3 to 8 and Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 to 4. Look at the history of Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4, and you will see that only men, because it was a male-dominated society, the men would get the education, the men would make the decision, and so on. In our today's society, women are educated and women can have a choice in divorcing. So only men would divorce. And men in Moses' day were marrying, based on the culture in the society, more than one woman. So if the man found a fault with his wife, um, he could easily put her away. He could divorce her and he could go and he could marry another person. Um, and so what was happening is that in Moses' day, there was an untidy situation where a man would have a fault, find it not like his wife again, and he could put away his wife if he wanted, but he wouldn't divorce her. So he would just abandon that wife and he would have other wives that he, he, he's being entertained, he's being fulfilled, he's being satisfied. And women could not go and work on, uh, unless they are a widow uh, or they are divorced. And this woman now is known to have a husband, but the husband is not providing for her and he has abandoned her and she's unable to move on with her life. And because of this untidy situation, Moses said to the, 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 the people, Moses thought about it, and Moses in trying to fix this civil situation, Moses said, write the woman out 
a, a, a bill of divorcement. Set her free. If you don't want her again, set her free so that now she's divorced, she can go and find employment and she can provide for herself. And she won't have to stay with the impression that she's married, she's suffering, her needs are not being fulfilled, and she cannot provide for herself. So that's the situation that prevailed in Moses' day. So Moses was giving um, an order to solve an untidy situation in a civil society. Moses was not writing a theological thesis, and he was not writing a theological dissertation that is of ecclesiastical significance he was solving a civil situation that is what took place in moses day so so jesus says out of the hardness of your heart where men would cause their wives to suffer and not set them free when they don't want them because their needs were he said moses said you have to moses allowed them to say but he said from the beginning that's not what it should be Marriages can be destroyed, however, and Jesus does indicate that. So there are various reasons why marriages may be destroyed. Marriage rests on the principle of love, of loyalty, of exclusiveness, of trust and support upheld by both partners in obedience to God. So Jesus was not naive, and I am not naive to think that marriages cannot be destroyed. And marriages can be destroyed for more reasons than fornication. But what we are saying here from the biblical perspective, that, uh, that if the marriage is destroyed, that the reason for remarriage would be fornication. So when there is difficulties in the marriages, we should exercise grace. The grounds for divorce and remarriage that we have seen in the scriptures uh, Jesus spoke about fornication. Uh, we read that already. And uh, I'm going to read this as my final text, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 to 15. I'm going to read this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, even though I think the time might be up, the 45 minutes is up, and I am trying to stick as close to it as possible. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 to 15. The, the, the Bible says, let me read this one. And unto the married command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest I speak not the Lord. If any brother hath his wife and believeth not, and she is pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that liveth not, believeth not. And if he please to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were you children uh, unclean, but now they are holy. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such a case, in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So from this, just like from the text that Jesus, we, where Jesus quoted, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has deduced that an unbelief, someone abandoning the faith and leaving their Seventh-day Adventist spouse give them reason that they can both divorce and remarry. Um, abandonment for the gospel sake. And um, this is something that has been debated for years and in more recent times have been accepted as a reason for divorce and remarriage. So um, what does the Seventh-day Adventist Church say? And I'm just going to list what this, and you can, Find this now in the SDA Church Manual and pages one. You can read from page 192 thereabout, and this is the 2000 edition. And it, and it makes some important statements that I will close on that will guide you on what the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes in terms of divorce and remarriage. So it, first of all, it says that marriage is permanent, so you must not put away your wife. 
So it is not God's intention for divorce to take place. Secondly, is that unfaithfulness and, and abandonment for the gospel sake um, gives the person the right both to divorce and remarry. Um, and when it comes to fornication, you will see on this slide that fornication is any sexual deviance. Um, uh, sex is only to take place between the husband and wife. So it's any type of sexual deviance, including homosexuality. The person go to sleep with a member of the same sex, um, uh, bestiality, child abuse, and so on. Any type of fornication. All right. Um, then the third point here is that in the event that reconciliation, so, so, so we are saying even though that fornication and abandonment for the gospel sake, that first the Adventist should seek reconciliation. If you can't solve it on your own, seek professional help. And then thirdly, in the in event that reconciliation is not effective, the spouse who have remarried, remained faithful and not violated the vow that that's that's not committed fornication has the right to both divorce and remarry. Uh, number four, the spouse who has violated the marriage vow um, she, uh, and, and, and goes on and, 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 and divorce and remarry is subject to the discipline of the church. Uh, he says a spouse who has violated the marriage vow and who is divorced and does not have the moral right to marry another while the spouse who has been faithful to the marriage vow uh, still lives and remains unmarried and chaste. Um, that person, the person who does so, shall be removed from the church membership. The person who he or she marries, if a member, shall also be removed from the church membership. So if they marry outside of the principles and standards, that the, the, the Bible teaches and the church outlines, they are subject to the discipline of the church. Separation or divorce, which results from factors such as physical violence, unfaithfulness, uh, physical violence, or which unfaithfulness to the marriage vow is not involved, does not give either one the spiritual right to remarry, unless in the meantime, the other party has remarried committed adultery, fornication, or die. So what this means is that this marriage contract lasts even if you separate and divorce. The first person to commit fornication is the one who breaches the contract. So maybe fornication was not the reason why you separate. But how, after you have separated, one person commit fornication, then the other person is free. Or you may divorce. And it's not because of fornication. And one person goes and sleeps with another person. The other person is free. Or the one Adventist divorce for other reasons than fornication and remarry. Then after that one remarries, the one that is left chaste and did not breach the contract and did not remarry is free to remarry also. Uh, all right. So um, let me wrap it up by saying, so the final analysis, the last few points the manual makes is that um, if the person goes and remarry other than the principles that is taught by the Adventist church, they are subject to the discipline of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And when they are disfellowship from the church, the, 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 the manual says that they cannot just come back in the church. They will have to make an application to the conference committee in order for the committee to make a decision for them to be readmitted in the church. And the final thing is that if they, a person divorce for any other reason than fornication or abandonment for the gospel's sake, and they, 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 they want to remarry, no Adventist pastor has the right to do that wedding. So they, 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 if they are going to remarry and it's not fornication or abandonment for the gospel's sake, and they choose to go find somebody else to do the wedding, that's up to them, that's their choice, but they are subject to the discipline of the church. Any Adventist pastor who performs such a wedding is also subject to the discipline of the Seventh-day Adventist church. So those are some principles that guides the matter of divorce and remarriage. Final thing I would say is that 
in order for a Seventh-day Adventist who is divorced to get remarried and they want to keep within the principles of the church, they should make an application to the church board. The local church board can make a decision on it. So they will present their case, don't have to present everything. If, if a fornication is involved, all they need to do is to say, and then now the church board should look at the facts and to see if it is true and to make a decision. And the church board has no authority to grant permission for remarry other than for abandonment for the gospel's sake or proof of fornication. And what does proof involve? Well, they, they have video of it. Sometimes they present a video. Um, they have text messages. They have letters. They have the, the divorce petition um, that was that was granted says that the person was unfaithful. Um, they have evidence, witnesses, um, and so on. The person admit that they were unfaithful. And I have called um, former spouses, um, ex-husband, ex-wife, and they say, yes, I was unfaithful. So that frees the person who is requesting permission for remarriage to be remarried. So the board can vote it or they can apply to the Conference Divorce and Remarriage Committee and the Conference Divorce and Remarriage Committee can vote it. And I recommend, having chaired the committee for years, that the board or the Conference Divorce and Remarriage Committee should give a letter to the person to say that the committee has voted it. And so it would give the Adventist pastor the permission to perform such a wedding. Nevertheless, avoid fornication. This is the big word that Jesus used. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2. My final slide. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor with the Lord. There is joy and happiness in the marriage. And you don't enjoy your money. You don't enjoy your nice car and your nice house if you don't have someone to share it with. And who better to share it with than a loving, supportive wife? But you need to be a loving, supportive husband yourself that prioritize your family, that next to God, you are going to give your family priority and you are going to love them and treat them right. And if there is mistake and if there is challenge in the marriage, that you're going to resolve those, that you're going to restore the relationship to avoid divorce. May God bless you. May the Lord guide you as you deal responsible, responsibly with this principle of divorce and remarriage. May the Lord help that if you are already married, that you will stay together. And if you're not yet married, when you get married, that you will apply the necessary principles to maintain the relationship. And that as a pastor, you will deal fairly with the cases of divorce and remarriage in your local congregation or wherever you serve. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Dennis, for taking us through that. We are going to have a moment for questions. We're going to have that, We're gonna have that now. And I have two and questions, have two questions. so far. We are a little pressed for time, so we may try to accommodate some a little later. But I have two for you right now. Yes. Uh, here's the first one, Doc. This one says, you mentioned that according to scripture, divorce is accepted only on the basis of fornication. I believe you dealt with this, but you'll have to go yes. again. What if a husband consistently, emotionally, and physically abuses his wife? What advice would you give? Well, uh, one is the first that the, the first point is that when you have any situation, including um, physical and emotional abuse, that uh, makes you unhappy, you need to confront your spouse on that. So you have to say um, some of the things you have been saying to me, you're ugly, you're fat, you, you, you're dunce, you know, some of those things are when you push me in the wall, um, I, I, I don't appreciate that. So you have to find a nice way and a nice time to confront the person. If you are unable to do that on your own, you will need a professional third party. And that is why I am saying every pastor should be equipped in at least basics in Christian counseling so that you can serve your members and you can make your pastoral visitation and assist them. If the pastor is unable to help, then you're going to find uh, somebody like myself, who is not just a pastor, but a psychologist now, 
who can help the persons to resolve those conflicts. Um, uh, the Adventist church principle is, you don't want to stay in it and the person kill you. So if the person is not responding, and many persons who are abused, as we'll say, will not respond, um, then if the person will not respond, then you might have to flee, escape for your life. Now, escaping for your life, as the church principle says, does not mean give you the right for remarriage. If after you escape the man or the woman, and in your case, it would be a woman, and women can abuse pastors. Uh, um, so if, they, if you escape for your life as a pastor, um, doesn't give you the right to remarry. But if in the case the woman now goes and finds somebody else, or she gives up the faith, abandons the faith and her religion, then that would give you the opportunity for remarriage. If not, that does not happen, then you, 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 um, and it does not mean that you have to divorce in the first place. It doesn't mean you have to divorce if you are separated. But if you are separated and divorced, uh, or if the person might divorce you and you don't have a choice in it, they go to the US and they divorce you, you're a divorcee. Um, what it means is that if you go and remarry outside of fornication, then the, the principle of the church is for pastors, I can tell you this, is that you are subject for your credential to be removed. Um, it is not a must, but the general conference policy is that your credential as a divorcee may be removed. Now, if, if you had nothing to do with it and it's a person who, who, who divorce you, I imagine that the church would, would look at favor in keeping you as an employee, but, but at the same time, it does not give you the right for remarriage. So there are various things that could cause you not to be able to work out the relationship, but not all of them gives you the right for remarriage. That's, that's what the, that the church teaches. You know, Doc, there is a there is a follow up statement yes. or question that mentions that it seems like a lifetime punishment for the guilty party not to be able to remarry. And I tell you, it's it's something it, it's big, that is anticipated. But what I have found is that in many of these cases, God takes care of His children; they will work out. In many of these cases, where persons are, um, uh, they, they 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 do. They will work out. Um, and I remember one elder, and he never believed in divorce. <laughs> Incidentally, he was saying that you must never remarry if your wife left you. And he confronted me on the floor and that the Bible don't give any reason. And then he was a lay preacher, preaching up a storm. And he saw him that his wife left him. And ultimately, he wanted to remarry because he does not have the gift of singleness. The same man who was saying there's no reason for you to. And so... His wife now left the faith and she started sleeping with other men. So he had reason. And he came to me and said, boy, you know, I'm planning to get remarried. I wouldn't judge him, even though he was killing me as a pastor before, to say, even if the woman is unfaithful, you can't remarry. I'm not going to judge him. I use the same principle of the Bible because that's what we need to stand up as ministers to say, yes, she has abandoned the faith and she's unfaithful. And now he's remarried. He's, he's doing well. With his family and he's a one of our faithful elders in the Seventh day Church. All right, my the final question that I have is what if the marriage is destroyed and one part does not want to go back into the relationship? Yes. What steps can you take? What can you do about that? And it is two will have to work on the marriage as long as you live. Anytime one person does not want the relationship, they have a choice. So not because you're a holy man and you're a pastor doesn't mean that your wife is going to always want to stay with you. She might reach a stage in her life when she thinks that you are non-progressive and um, she wants to move on. And she, she as, as with many pastors whose wife have migrated to greener pastures, um, your wife might choose. Um, and, and, and so it is two that makes the relationship. Uh, there are situations where there's a, per there's a person who becomes, uh, gets involved with another man. And, and I'm using man because it can go both ways. But the woman gets involved with another man and she, she is attached to him uh, and does not want to give up that, that intimate relationship with that other man. Um, she's unfaithful to you. Um, you can be hosier if you want to continue to pursue and to pursue and to pursue. But uh, both the male and the female does not have to submit themselves to that. There comes a time when you might have to say, this relationship is not going to work out because one cannot allow to work. 
So if the person does not want the relationship anymore and you have tried professional counseling help and they want to move on with their life, you can't keep them a prisoner because they're going to make your life a misery. And I say to, to many young pastors in the past, I'm saying to you, sometimes if you can't save both your marriage and your ministry, then save your ministry if you can and continue to minister as, as best as possible, as long as you can, and to be faithful, right? And as I said, many of these situations, they will work out themselves. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis. I don't have any more questions, either on YouTube or on Zoom. Right. And uh, some people have said it is a hard saying, who can bear it? But yes. We, yes. we we have received hard instructions. Hard saying, indeed, where... indeed. Hard saying, indeed. And one of the main thing I will say as I close, because I know you have other presenters, is this. Marriage works by investment. When you are dating, you will make investment to go pick up that young lady, to take her to dinner, to remember the special days. And if you need, a, 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 you have a little quarrel and you can't resolve it, you call off a trusted friend. My, while in marriage, that might not be the ideal because we say seek professional help. But the investment that some people make when they are dating, they don't make it when they are married. Uh, married. And, and, and anytime you lose the friendship, that's when the marriage is deteriorating and will die. So marriage is an investment. You must invest. Don't be too busy to invest time in family worship. You must pray with your family. That will help you to maintain your marriage. Don't, don't remember to share your finances. I've met pastors who don't share their finances. Their wife don't know how much money they work. One fleshness means that you share everything. Communication is important to the woman. It's, it's her number one need. Communic romance and communication. Make sure that you romance and, and communicate with your wife. Make big investment in your relationship. You might say, what if I invest in it and it don't work out? Well, if you're not willing to invest in it, marriage is not for you. Marriage is a big investment. And so you're going to put everything in it. And you're going to invest in it. Time, money, and all the resources necessary for it to be maintained. And, 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 and most of the time, it will work out if you give it your best. But I am not naive. We are in a sinful world. And sometimes external shocks and factors may destroy the marriage. But if you are faithful in making your investment and it does not work, you will be satisfied that you would have given it your best. This I will say, if you make your investment, your full investment, your marriage is most likely to work. Most of those marriages will work. If you don't make the full investment, your marriage is already destroyed. So the choice is yours. May God bless you. Take care of yourselves. Right. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. We have some questions coming in here at the tail end. I hope we'll be able to deal okay, with them. Okay. Well, it's your well. time. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I am going to hand over. I am going to hand over to our yes. president. He will take us into the next steps. But perhaps we can have these questions addressed slightly later. I don't know if you'll stick around with us, Dr. Davis. No, I have another presentation almost now. So I, I really oh, have to okay. hop off now. As a matter of, yes, almost now. So I, so I have to hop off. It's almost 3.30. So um, All right. I'm heading well, over to the Knock Patrick Seventh day Adventist Church now. Thank you for your yes. time. And maybe another time we could continue the conversation. All right. Thank you so much again, Dr. Dennis. Uh, Pastor... I will now hand over to Roger, who will take us into our next segment. All right. Thank you very much, um, Theodore. So at this time, we'll be going for our next presentation, which will be done by Mrs. Orchid Smith. And Mrs. Orchid Smith has been a passionate educator and school administrator for over 30 years. Her professional experience includes serving as principal of the Heidel High School, principal of the St. Anne's Bay High and preparatory school, among others. Presently, she serves as a principal of the Victor Dixon High School. She's a graduate of the former West Indies College no 
Northern Caribbean University, where she earned a BS in Biological Science. She completed her diploma in education from the Michael University, University and, and her MA in Educational Administration from Northern Caribbean University. A consummate believer in lifelong learning, Mrs. Smith is currently reading uh, to come ready to complete the PhD in Educational Leadership. Additionally, she serves as the Vice President of the Jamaica Independent Schools Association, that is GIC, and is a board member of the Overseas Examination Commission. Mrs. Smith is a poor product of Christian education and is likewise a passionate advocate. She is happily married to Dr. Joseph Smith, who she probably supports in ministry. Their union has been blessed with four, four beautiful, beautiful daughters. daughters. Mrs. Smith loves the Lord, holds the stellar standards of excellence, and moreover, advocates the biblical pronouncement to train up a child in the way he should grow, and when he's old, he shall not depart from it. So this time we'll be hearing from Mrs. Hawking Smith. All right, thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. Robert, Robert Williams. Williams. And I noticed that um, Theodore was hosting so far, Roger Williams. And uh, may I just greet the staff of the SRT, those who are on and the students of that department, persons participating this afternoon and just tell you that I'm humbled and I'm for the opportunity to share with you this afternoon. The topic that I have been given is team ministry and I have been working in teams all my life. And as a matter of fact, to get me here this afternoon, it took a team. It took a team, my husband, getting me here from another parish, <laughs> my daughter helping out my mother. And it, it is a wonderful joy to be able to have people that you can count on and that you can depend on. And um, my family provides that for me. I want to also commend the team that is involved this afternoon. And let me just share, just share my first slide. Are you able to share with me at this time? Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. First slide says, every day, in some way, you are a part of the team, a part of a team. So Roger, you are a part of a team. Theodore, you are a part of the team. I see you, Pastor Chambers, you are a part of the team. And those who are on this afternoon, you are a part of the wonderful team attending or contributing to the success of this program in some way or the other. And I have um, limited time this afternoon. And so I have to move quickly, albeit I won't be very long, I'll try to get to the salient points very quickly. So let's, let's move along. You might be fully aware of that teams come in various shapes and sizes and uh, Never forget 
uh, no matter you, what you want to do, it really takes teamwork to make the dream work. And that's from John C. Maxwell. This week we were, and as a matter of fact, still going on in the sports arena, we have the National Boys and Girls Athletic Championships. And why am I speaking about it? Because we're talking about teams. And although we are emphasizing teams in ministry, we have to look at the relevance at this time. And we know how important a relay team is because we have been on the edge of our seats on so many occasions when the person running on the back stretch, when somebody, one of the connecting persons just dropped the baton and the relay team was disqualified. And we are just so heartbroken because we were there cheering for our team. And now because one member of the team dropped the baton, there the team would not be placed. And so, so we are fully aware of teams. And uh, in ministry, I have been working with my husband in team ministry for many years. And I know that is what we want to focus on, but we have to contextualize as we go along. So I just spoke about the teams in sports. I, at the beginning, I talked about the teams planning the ministerial refresh. Then I mentioned the team in motion to get me here this afternoon. And I want to move to the, the team. Jesus in executing the plan of salvation with his father was that he was a team. And uh, I've always thought about this very provoking factor, very provoking factor to me. The issue of when Jesus seemed to have become scared. And as we see on the screen, Matthew 24, verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And uh, Jesus just seemed very scared in that moment. He was on the cross and uh, we know the story. He was about to die. And he cried out to his father in heaven in a moment when he recognized that and he would have signed off on this at the beginning. He would have to be alone in death. He would have to be alone in the grave. At those times, there would be nobody there for him. Although he knew that he would be resurrected, that human component was there. But the student of the Bible would recognize that Jesus was actually quoting from the Messianic Psalm 22, which reads, my God, my God, that is Psalm 22 verse one reads, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? and from the words of my roaring. So I said, he seemed scared, but he really wasn't scared because he knew that his father had his back. He was fully aware of the plan and exactly what he would have to go through to have the final portions of the plan of salvation executed to its triumphant conclusion. And you and I today are a part of that plan. And as we continue to be faithful, as we remain faithful, we will reap the reward. And so we, we look at the um, 
biblical perspective of marriage and teaming up as we go into the, the presentation. Um, and I heard Dr. Roy Dennis, you know, echoing a few items on the, that are also on my slide. And I know that um, the presentations have some intersections. Marriage is a sacred union established by God. In it, two individuals uniquely become one for the ultimate sublime purpose of reflecting God's love, his justice, mercy, and his benevolence to the world. So marriage is designed by God to be a win-win situation, but there's a third win. It's a win for God, a win for the husband, and it's a win for the wife. Um, <clears throat> And uh, persons who enter into this marriage union seek this kind of cooperation with God, oneness with him and oneness with each other. So Genesis, Genesis um, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 presents that ideal that ideal um, one, oneness, where the word of God declares that a man should leave his mother and his father and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. And um, it is such a remarkable um, occasion and marriage is said to be on that day, as a matter of fact, on the day of marriage, the psychologist will say that that will be the happiest day of your life. As you join to your husband as a wife and the, and the husband joins to his wife and as you seek union with God. Um, Ephesians 5 verse 31 uses this same image of Genesis to emphasize the oneness in marriage. Where that echo, this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife. So the, the thread is moving through the Bible. So it's in the beginning, it's Paul in Ephesians um, is echoing that same sentiment there. And uh, sharing and reflecting God must be paramount when dealing with the concerns of each spouse. And uh, I'm moving quickly into if the spouse is a minister. So we're moving quickly into the matter of team ministry. Now, Therefore, the two as a team in ministry are better and stronger when they present a united front. They have become one flesh, not in the physical sense, but yes, one coin. The coin has um, the head and the tail. Well, the husband and the wife should not be the head and the tail, but two different sides of the coin. We, we said earlier, each one is unique and that should be brought to the marriage. That should be brought also now to team ministry in spirit, in purpose, in, in mission. So as we continue, the team dynamic is beneficial and crucial in both marriage and ministry. 
if the principle of team ministry is established by Jesus is applied to the oneness in marriage, great things can be accomplished in the Christian home, in mission, and in the pastoral ministry. As we move on, a husband and wife who are committed in ministry and marriage will complement each other with their individual talents and strengths and will become a blessing in their home, in the church they serve, in their community also. And Ellen G. White says that the Lord would have ministers and their wives closely united in this work. The husband and wife can so blend in labor that the wife shall be the complement of her husband. So as you partner in ministry, it can be very challenging, however, very rewarding. The Jonas Arias says in his, his book, no profession in the world requires the involvement of a spouse more than that of being a pastor. He declares that, he, yes, when, when a doctor gets married, his wife, if he's male, his wife cannot prescribe any medication. If a lawyer, whether it's a female or a male spouse, same would um, carry for a lawyer. She's not able to give legal advice unless she is a lawyer herself. But it's very different in pastoral ministry. And so once you are married to a minister and in our contemporary society now, the minister is not always male, but predominantly male most of the times, but I have to present it in an unbiased way. The degree of involvement varies depending on the situation, the cultures, the people, or the churches. Nonetheless, the spouse in ministry is viewed as a partner in the church, from the church's perspective, from the, spouse, uh, the spouse's perspective, the, the, um, the partner should work in team ministry with the other. Certain expectations are the order of a day when you are a pastor's spouse. And so persons, who are planning to get married, or if you're married already, yes, there are certain expectations and you can't avoid them. Persons are going to expect you not just to come to church and sit down, but they're going to expect you to get involved. They're going to expect you to give some advice. They're going to listen to what you have to say, what's your opinion on this matter? And you have to be very careful as you, as you dispense any advice as a pastor's spouse, but there are expectations, expectations about your physical appearance. There are expectations about your family, the, how you relate to your family and how you relate to your children, if and when they do come, how you, and how you relate to the church. The, as you seek to partner in ministry with your husband or wife, recognize the priorities and ignore the unnecessaries. So don't get caught up in things that will create division and the challenges that are, don't, don't, don't go seeking for challenges that are unnecessary. So recognize what are the priorities. We, we are God's servant. We are here 
to bring honor and glory to God. Yes, we are here in team ministry, soul winning and building and nurturing the church and our families are very important. Consider how God can be glorified through a shared ministry. So the husband and the wife should be looking for ways for that spouse, that partner to become involved in the ministry in a meaningful way. And that has to be in line with the talents. So once upon a time, um, some wives felt a bit threatened because they couldn't do what they were expected to do by the congregations. And we had said earlier that they, based on the persons you meet in the congregation, based on the church, based on the culture, the needs, the demands, they are different. So you have to consider the environment you are in and find ways to minister that are effective and are relevant. If you're a pastor, discover ways to create the right environment to involve your spouse in ministry. And so you have to look at what is needed here and what are my gifts and talents. And sometimes you also develop those gifts and talents as you come as you come of age as you become more mature what are some of the things you would do so i have some examples here um a pastoral visit yes a pastor could take his wife along on a pastoral visit and you're visiting a family your your wife you have children look at the situation and see if your wife or your children would complement that particular visit you could look at hosting an event together look at doing a small group study i remember um, my husband early very early in ministry he used to engage me in clinching baptismal decisions especially of the young persons especially of young persons and uh, sometimes i would be drawn in at very short notice but i i was he taught me to be very effective and i found out that i was very effective too because i would be able to talk to to mothers speak to young children and speak to young people. And uh, being in education, I was able to reach them very effectively. And many of them gave their lives to Christ. And uh, I have the joy of being able to relate to them, to meet so many of them from time to time. Um, there, there are so many things that persons could do. The, Invite persons home for a meal. And I know many people might be challenged, but when you invite somebody into your home, you let them know you value them. If you have a particular skill that would benefit the members, find they will, they will be better off for learning. Lend your talent, share your talent. Um, they also, you can think of, you can think of what are the things that are needed in the community you are serving, in the context of where you are. Also, when you marry somebody, you have to think of what are their particular um, areas that they are talented in. What would they bring to the marriage? So I'm speaking here now to ministerial students. Some of you may be married, some of you may not be married, some of you may be looking 
to find somebody adequate for marriage. And you wonder what type of person, what type of person should I look for? Well, I'm going to tell you, you must look for somebody who loves people. It's, if it's somebody who, I don't want to relate to people. I don't want to talk to people. No, that, that cannot be the right person. It has to be somebody who loves people and is willing to share their lives, share you as the pastor with other people. And it cannot be a jealous person. So <clears throat> let me hurry on. When, as we, we look at your union should reflect God's character and very quickly in love, in justice, in mercy, in benevolence. And uh, the, the Bible talks about this oneness principle and the unique gifts that each one should should bring and that a husband and wife should work collaboratively in ministry. Um, <laughs> so I said earlier, the person should um, love people and you will have to decide whether somebody is a person who loves people, who is interested in interacting with people. Um, is this person willing to make friends with persons in the church? Is this person somebody that is hospitable? Will this person always, and I'm so scared to say this, but will this person always be someone who wants to always go to church and eat lunch, never taking anything, never giving, always wanting to take and uh, hopefully you the you as a minister you're not that type of a person yourself the person needs to be a godly person who wants who desires to connect their lives to god and uh, is not looking for this partnership in ministry as one that will just propel them into the spotlight. So it's not, <clears throat> it's not your, it's not somebody seeking the spotlight. It is somebody who is seeking to serve. So I, I'm trying to frame it in, in, in that way as we move on. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 9 to 12 continues this biblical principle, which says that two are better than too many. And so marriage is honorable and marriage is, is um, recommended. And uh, the, the scripture says, two are better than too many because they have a good reward for their labor. It means they complement each other. You're, you are able to see something that your partner cannot see. And this is something, there's something that my, my husband would say, if you are both alike. If both of, both of you are alike, one is unnecessary. And so <clears throat> you're looking for somebody who want to be, um, be married to, somebody who will share ministry with you. Look for somebody who will compliment you in, in your ministry. So the text reads, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. So if you are a hot-tempered gentleman, are you looking for a hot-tempered lady? So that if there's any problem at the church and the husband is about to, to use his energies in a negative way, will the wife jump in and fire him up? Or will she be able to say that word in season from the Lord so that tempers will will um, dissipate and uh, God's spirit will rule. So, so the text says, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. And I, I dare assert that if the person is identical to you, you are still alone. Again, if two lie down together, 
they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by the of another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That is the husband, the wife, and God. So we move quickly on. Um, an essential part of ministry is choosing somebody who is not your competitor, but the word I coin here is your completor. And so how much more can I say on that? Someone who is not going to compete with you. I preach this Sabbath, you preach next Sabbath. It has to be somebody who will complete you, not compete with you. Team ministry is not competition. It is somebody um, joining forces with the other, the pastor and the spouse, joining forces with God and with each other to enhance the ministry of Christ. All right. We partners in ministry need to work to, together much more than um, being apart. So try to be together much more than being apart. And I heard Dr. Roy Dennis speak about the, um, the matter of divorce in ministry and divorce in the church, yes. And he says, you know, happily that most cases can be resolved successfully, but there are times when persons have to part. But one of the things that needs to be done is that partners in ministry need to work to be together much more than they are apart. So try not to take appointments that will cross thread and that will have you have your schedules so divided that you can't support each other. Like for example, this afternoon, the um, Pastor Smith is here with me. So although we have another appointment in Kingston um, in a few minutes, so we are here, uh, we're here in Kingston and we'll move on to another appointment. So he's here giving me support. And so it's important um, that I am with him at his appointment and he is with me as far as possible. So we are not competitors. We are working as um, team partners, <clears throat> sorry, in ministry. Now, the, let's look at what um, Ellen G. White says in Evangelism, page 491. And she echoes it once again, when it is possible, let the minister and his wife go forth together. The wife can often labor by the side of her husband, accomplishing a noble work. And you have pulled me out to participate this afternoon, and, and, and that is a good thing. She can visit homes of the people and can help the women in these families in a way that a husband cannot do. So a woman can be connected easily to other women, can sense what is happening, especially if you are an intuitive woman, you can, you can sense the mood, you can sense the situation, you can ask the right questions that will help to solve the questions, um, solve the problems that are being encountered by the families at that time. So yes, one of the things I remember when I had small children, I would take my children to visit, with, along with my husband, take them to visit the homes, the, um, especially um, on the holiday time, we would visit the homes for the elderly. They wouldn't get a lot of visitors and 
the children who would participate in sharing their talents and cards any, and any little gifts. And so I was developing in them that spirit of volunteerism at that time, that spirit of empathy. And uh, I remember carrying it over into the school when um, I became principal. I would ensure that we have several days each year when we would visit the persons from different nursing homes, children's home, and I would have them take gifts. We would even visit the veterans home. And I found that this developed empathy and love in the heart of those children when they were able to go and see um, the elderly recognize that one day they would become old too. Also, they were able to talk with some of them and they would share their life stories and they would, they would learn. And so it's important for the partner in ministry to desire to work with people, work in their homes. No, we are not Mother Teresa and her helpers, but we serve God, and he has commissioned us to do that. There are great benefits to team ministry. And uh, we said earlier, but it's, this is showing it, it's a graphic representation. Um, it's a win-win-win situation. God's character is revealed to the world through team ministry. It's, so God wins, the wife wins when she bonds with God and her husband and finds fulfillment and the husband wins as the spiritual relationship with God is developed and also the bonds with his wife are strengthened. Um, the, very briefly, the role of the pastor's spouse Wherefore, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And so if you have to ensure that if you are still in the position to choose, you choose somebody who will want to partner with you in comforting. Sometimes as an experienced pastor's wife, wife, sometimes the church can be very hard in terms of the different situations that pastors, elders, the church members have to encounter the difficult problems, the difficult problems that have to be solved and sometimes the pastor can get very discouraged. Sometimes the and, and so he needs to have someone who he can relate to. While he doesn't have to articulate all of the problems, the wife has to be sensitive enough to know when things are not going as, as, as they should and provide that type of emotional support for her husband, as the case may be. No, we're living in a world <laughs> and um, it's, it's not uncommon to recognize that we are in an evil world. And uh, we may be even in areas where bullets are ricocheting and uh, there's always an unseen enemy that will create problems for the, for the family. If we are not covered under the blood of Jesus, there is no success and there will not be no success in that marriage. So the point I'm making here, that person has to know the Lord. If you are choosing somebody, it must be somebody who desires to pray, and to serve the Lord, somebody who will wrap their lives in the love of Jesus Christ because times will not always be easy. So quickly, 
I look at the role of the pastor, spouse includes um, providing support through encouragement. We, we just touched on that. Respect ministering in the family circle. So yes, ministering, ministering in the church, but also to the, ch the children in the family, to the husband first, if the wife, it is, it is communicated very widely, the wife is a pastor's pastor. So wife has to, a wife has to have her own calling from God. Well, a wife will never be formally ordained as the husband, the wife has a call on her life. In the same way, and even in a more, in a deeper way, the, each member of the body of Christ is called to serve Christ. The pastor is called at a higher level. And I dare say the pastor's wife is called at a high level, but not at the ordination level. So it is a high and holy calling. So you minister in your, your way in the church, but also never fail to minister to the family circle also. So this family circle has to do with the pastor and, and also the children. How do you minister to the children? If, they, if, if Ellen G. White in Adventist home says the, the home is a family firm. And so it's like a company, it's a foundation, it's a business, it's a family business. And we all have our part to play in that business. And so the spouse should not be, that is whether the pastor or the wife, or the prospective, and you have to observe, can't be a lazy person. Can't be a lazy person. And that cannot be overemphasized. Has to be someone on both sides who cares for domestic duties because clothes will always have to be washed. The house will have to be cleaned. Meals will have to be prepared. And so has to be both of you along with the children when that time comes that you are willing to work together for the success of the family. All right, and we, we, we hear the, the cycle of respect here. And uh, let's, let's move on very quickly. I know my time is coming to a close quickly. We look at members' perception versus God's empowerment. The pastor, and when the pastor and the spouse moves into the church, some churches might want the wife to hold an office in every department. And some wives are very talented. They can hold offices. They can be the choir leader. They can be the church clerk. They can be in treasury, yes. But the members might want you to hold offices in, and especially when they recognize that you are very gifted. And then you have some who believe that you should be silent and voiceless. And there are also some wives who believe they should be silent and voiceless and they look on husbands, Pastors, prospective pastors, please do not give your spouse to be the idea that she must be silent and voiceless in the church or to the other end of the continuum that they should hold every office in the church. She won't have any time for you if you have her holding all the offices. And if she feels as if she is a voiceless member of the congregation, also a voiceless member of the team, it means there are so many things that she will observe, but she won't have the confidence in giving you any information, any information that could be valuable. I remember 
making sure that I would meet the brethren of the church and I would know their names. So I would know their names and I would be able to tell my husband the names and I would know the families. And that was one of my specialties. I would ensure because I want to make sure that every member was met and everyone felt important. And so I love to interact with people. And so that came naturally for me. God wants us to, to use our gifts in his cause. And he gives us many avenues to serve. Some may serve from the front. Some will serve in a, a role that is not as public, but God wants you to serve nevertheless. The, um, he who finds a wife and those who are looking, you make sure you don't have to use a microscope. Just open your eyes and see. Don't go head over heels. Just open. You, you go head over heels, you won't see. You'll be rolling over and over, and then so many of the things you will not be able to, to see. So he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord declares Proverbs 18, verse 22. Now I want to just veer a little bit. When we speak about team ministry, I wanted to involve the children a bit and give you a little perspective on that. It's a mixed experience for the, the children, according to my own experience and according to um, Dr. Arias, children can benefit greatly from team ministry. They view their parents in team ministry and they also look towards their own future lives and recognize how productive teamwork is. So even if they don't think of marrying a pastor in the future, they see the value of teaming up with a spouse in the service of the Lord. So children see God working first time in their parents and their lives. Children get to see God working in people's lives um, in the church. Children get to know and meet many people that might not, they would not have otherwise come in contact with. So it is a blessing. Children are witnesses to both good and bad and learn that life is a battle between the strong and the frail, the brave and the timid. Children grow to understand that God loves everyone and when we are serving others, we are serving him. Yes, children come in for unhealthy scrutiny, which can overwhelm them. But, but by the grace of God, we are trying to find a By the grace of God, the parents' godly examples should be able to, to um, be sufficient to to help to bolster them into, into the faith so that they become good Christian young people. Now, as I look to, to close, the, why would you want a partner in your ministry? According to John C. Maxwell, he, he, says, he, he says, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. And if you look historically, we like to think that there is a one man everywhere, whether in the government, in the church, there's a one man that can do many things and that can make great changes. That one man I declare to you this afternoon is, is God, but he works with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And in the context of our lives, any man who is achieving greatness has a team beside him, behind him. If he's a book writer, he has a team that helps. If he's a minister and he's successful, he has a team. There's no one man that doesn't work. So there is a myth out there that will not carry through in ministry. It is only in the movies. 
also why as you seek to carry on your your role as minister you are preparing many of you are preparing remember the goal of nurturing the church making disciples of all men is more important the, the goal is more important than the role also remember each person in the church in your family in your team as a place where they add the most value so don't try to get your spouse to do what she is not best at or that she is uncomfortable with doing this remember the strength of the team is impacted by the weakest link so both the husband and wife will want to be strong and utilize their talents sometimes you need a catalyst in the family somebody who is somebody who can get things going and remember teammates must be able to count on each other can i count on you can i count on you when the going gets tough can i count on you when the finances are not strong can we count on you to to be satisfied with what we have so that we we will make it better satisfy with what we have and that is you know the bible bible says emphatically godliness with contentment is great gain and so it must be in team ministry also we have to teach that and we have also to practice that as we as we um try to build team ministry and we try to make successful um products of team ministry now the in in conclusion the wife of a, the of a minister of the gospel can can either be most be a more successful helper and a great blessing to her husband or a hindrance to him in his work it depends very much on the wife whether a minister will rise from day to day in his sphere of usefulness or whether he will sink to the ordinary level. This is the concluding slide. My participants this afternoon. Hmm. Sometimes we have to scramble to our feet and uh, move to a situation very fast. You want to know that you have a partner who will cover you as you go. And that covering you means praying for you. So you have to move out of there in a whisk. You don't, we want somebody who is not going to just whine and complain because they would have understood the high calling they would have understood that there are so much happening around us the society is so complex and the unseen enemy is always at work and so i close by saying team ministry works if we cover each other in prayer as we walk day by day as we go along life journey so ensure, as you seek a partner, um, religion majors, find somebody who will help to cover you as you seek to serve the Lord. Amen. Right, right. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Smith, for a wonderful presentation. You know, you shared with us that God has set an example for team ministry, uh, a pattern for the pastor and his spouse to follow. You know, you also shared with us that they are, they are unique, and this uniqueness is to be used as a complement. Um, 
usage in ministry. And also that, you know, you would have given us some tips, you know, uh, person in ministry, you know, who it is that they are to marry, that one, the person ought to be godly, friendly, right? Uh, not seeking the spotlight as, as you shared. And also, you know, there are two quotes that, that stood out to me. Uh, I love them. They said that if both are the same, you know, one is unnecessary. And, and that was just something else. And if both are the same, you are still alone. So look at that. You know, you also share that, you know, there should not be competition within the relationship or the ministry, but rather one ought to be a competitor. Um, you know, of the other individual. And so thank you very much for sharing with us this afternoon. I, I have two questions so far though that I would like to, to share. And, um, you know, you can, you can help us in answering these two questions before we run along. Hello. Uh, so the first one is, and I think you don't touch a little on one especially. He says, what are some of the challenges and rewarding experiences that the wife faces in partnering ministry. So what are some of the challenges and rewarding experiences that the wife faces in partnering ministry? Thank you, very good question. Well, in terms of challenges, persons like to relate problems to you. People like to tell you their problems and they believe that you can solve many of them. <laughs> you have to know, you have to stay in your lane though. You have to know your areas of giftedness and you have to know when to refer that particular problem. You need to know when to be quiet and just pray. Many persons are fast on the draw to help people solve their problems, but sometimes people are only, they only want a listening ear. So you have to be very careful because as a pastor wife, pastor's wife, many challenges will come your way <clears throat> and many people will share their problems with you. Be careful as you posit solutions consult God first. Don't engage your mouth before you talk to God. And rewarding, rewarding number one, getting to meet persons and minister to them and growing your own spir yourself spiritually. Because when you know persons depend on you, you, are, you have to ensure that you have a reservoir of God's grace within you. And building myself spiritually has been um, something very positive for me as a pastor's wife. I hope that answers you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Smith, for, for that. And I just asked the second one. So I'm not only seeing two so far. I just asked the second one. And it says, there seems to be a growing tendency for the absence of wives in pastoral ministry. If this is so, um, what may have been the cause? So there seems to be a growing tendency of, for the absence of wives in pastoral ministry. And it says that if this is so, what may have been the cause? Somebody puts us uh, put in the chat interesting question. You say it seems to be, and you're asking me what is the cause. Let me just assert emphatically that I've always been with my husband. <laughs> so in um, <laughs> he's here with me today, and so we have been together and we share in ministry and it has been rewarding. And um, we practice that and we, <clears throat> but um, <laughs> it, it's interesting to be able to, to um, 
to share some reasons why persons may be absent. Sometimes their careers take them in different places. Sometimes there is need for more than what can be provided. Um, sometimes persons did not bargain for what they get. <laughs> and so they move on with different ideas. But um, it would be very good to speak to these persons individually to find out why have you moved on? Why don't you enjoy being near to your husband and being in team ministry with your husband uh, more regularly? They would be the ones to, to answer that outside of um, doing a research questionnaire, trying to get some feedback from the persons. Why are you not sharing in team ministry as we thought you would originally when you got married? I hope that um, shed some light on it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Smith, for sharing in these questions. And again, we thank you very much for your presentation. And the feedback has been good. It says lovely presentation, wonderful presentation. And once again, we thank you for taking the time out to be with us this afternoon. And we know that you have uh, another presentation um, you know, to attend. And we are so grateful for the team ministry to you know, yourself and Dr. Smith, as you may be here me at this time as well. So thanks again, and may God bless you as you continue to work in God's vineyard to win souls for the kingdom of God. Oh, yes. here he is in the back of man. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Thank you very much, and God bless you. And all God the bless you too, and um, have a successful program. Thank you. Thanks. So we now move on as we'll be having song as we transition into our next presentation. Five, four. Stood on the banks of a wide raging river, trusting that I'd get a cross. What fell I Mount Everest Knowing I'd have the strength for the climb It's through every trial, each test and temptation It's one thing that is sure every time Over and over again and again God is faithful
I find it very interesting that on the tail end of Mrs. Smith's presentation on teamwork in ministry or team ministry, that she actually mentioned children. Because our next presentation is on raising children while pastoring. And to pick up the baton is Pastor Carlington Hilton. And it's my distinct privilege to introduce him to you this evening. Pastor Hilton is from the parish of St. James and grew up in the Rosemount community, Montego Bay. At age 14, he began learning trade in becoming a furniture maker, in, in becoming a furniture maker, sorry, and did the same vocationally in building construction while in the Montego Bay Secondary School, now known as the St. James High School. Upon completion of secondary school, he continued to work as a furniture maker for a few years. He then went back to high school to further his education at the Harrison Memorial High School and graduated at age 22. And then he went on to Northern Caribbean University where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in religion and theology. In 2004, Pastor Hilton took up employment at the North Jamaica Conference and for the 18 years, he has served in many capacities, such as district pastor, director of Sabbath school and personal ministries, community services director, family ministries director, ministerial secretary, assistant to the president for leadership. And he currently serves as the executive secretary since the conference's last quadrennial session in February, 2022. Pastor Il Hilton also holds a Master of Divinity degree in leadership from Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, the United States of America. He is married to Sandra and has three fun-loving boys, Carson, who is 12 years old, Drayson, who is nine, and Kadravel, who is three years old. Pastor Hilton's philosophy for life is whatever the mind can conceive, you can achieve as long as God allows it. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Pastor Carlington Hilton to take us into the presentation on pastoring while raising children. All right, so thanks again, Rashim Smith, for making that introduction. I am pleased to be here this afternoon. I happen to be here a little listening to Sister Smith's presentation. And indeed, I was blessed. I am not, let me put it the other way. I am a daddy for the past 12 years, as you would have read in my introduction a while ago. So when I stop to think about parenting, I, I have just 12 years of experience and uh, would consider myself to be least qualified in talking about pastors and, and children. However, Parenting sometimes is not about when you become a biological parent. But all of us on this platform, whether you're married or not, or whether you have children or not, your parents would have been teaching you how to become a parent. So all of us have a little parenting skills here. And um, we, we are, we are, we are, you know, we will be passing on or replicating ourselves into our children. And so from time to time, it calls for some um, introspection as to what are some of the values from my parents I will take into my parenting skills, um, involving your spouse to, your spouse to becoming in the family with, with um, parenting skills. And sometimes the conflict arises when both are coming from two different worlds, Mars or Venus, you name it. Um, with different parenting skills. So thank you again for, for the invitation to share with you. And I remember many years ago when we used to have ministerial refresh 
and we would have not only among the ministers, but would have um, other persons who would want to share with us because of all the different clubs that existed on the hill there at Northern Caribbean University, there was something special about the ministerial department. And so those who had girlfriends would allow the girlfriends to come so that they could also be more acquainted looking into the future and the, what ministry would bring to the table and making that kind of preparation. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm feeling comfortable because I see familiar faces. I see Pastor Damien Chambers, um, who's on the platform. I see Gerald Duncan, um, Elder Duncan, I should say, what was ordained two weeks ago. And I think I also see Keith Cole, one of my elders here in the local church. So I'm gonna be presenting this afternoon on the topic that you have given to me. And um, let me take you through this presentation here. All right. So, so I love I love face-to-face -face interaction. I will do my best while I feel, feel a bit lonely here. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today for this opportunity that we can share together looking on this crucial subject of parenting, raising kids, but in a unique profession, and that is being a pastor. Lord, the rule of measurement that is used for our kids sometimes are not as fair as they're supposed to be. The measuring stick sometimes is, is, it, it, it is measured differently from other kids. But I pray for wisdom today, and I pray for your guidance with thoughts as I make this presentation, and that all of us will be blessed and your name will be glorified. We ask in Christ's name, we say amen. Um, can you just indicate a little to see, I want to know how many parents are here. There are 16 of us on the platform, two of the 16, meaning that Pastor Chambers have a double device. I see Keith Cole raising hand. Anybody else? Do we have? All right, Roger, you are a parent, Roger. Soon. Oh, soon I guess. to be. All right, I see three participants raise their hands. So we have Keith Cole, Luxley McCoy. Is this the Luxley McCoy, Roxanne McCoy's brother? Am I correct? Yes, yes Pastor. Name? Oh, mercy, my friend, I haven't seen you for the longest while. Blessings, Pastor. Good to, good to see you this evening. And, 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 and for all these years, now you're a daddy. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. All right. Marvin Price, and we say, Sean. All right. So I feel like I'm speaking to a group of persons um, who, who can identify a few things with me and while others look into the future where one day they will join the line of parenting. So raising children while pastoring, it's, 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 it's a unique responsibility. I wanna begin this afternoon with a story. As I talk about the subject of parenting while pastoring, I wanna speak of this man by the name of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday born in the 1800 jumped over into the 1900. Who was this Billy Sunday? Has anybody ever heard the name Billy Sunday before? Have you heard about this preacher? If, if that's the case, can I see a hand? Just, just put your hand in the chat if you've ever heard of Billy Sunday. All right. Uh, am I, am, am, let me see what I'm seeing here. Billy Sunday. Sean, you heard of Billy Sunday? Sean, I don't know if your hand went down. It's still up from the time I asked for those who are parents. So, Sean, you have heard of Billy Sunday? Rashim? Yes, Keith I've Cole? heard of him, Pastor. All right. All right, Rashim, good. You can put your hands on up. Keith Cole, you have heard of Billy Sunday? Uh, yes. All right, good. Sean, are you there? Cole, you can put on your hand. Where's Sean? Sean is not caught up in the rapture and left us behind. Sean, where are you, Sean? 
All right. I'm, I'm going to take down Sean's hand because Sean, Sean, Sean is caught up in the rapture, brethren, and may the Lord help us here on earth. <laughs> I hope I hope we can sing after this presentation and say, tell Jesus to send for me. Right, Sean? All right. <laughs> All right, then, brethren. So here is Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, a unique character in his time. Who was he? He was a famous baseball player. But sometime after his career, he became a preacher. Billy Sunday's parents were divorced. And he was left with his mother and seven other siblings. Very interesting. And so, and so I'm sort of trying to put my screen in a way that I can see a few persons because I love to see a few folks' faces. Um, he, he never got along well with his new stepfather. So his parents separated. He, his father went off. His mother got remarried. He never got along well with his stepfather. And he moved out at age six to live with his grandfather. Just, just imagine the dysfunctionality that has been taking place at a tender age. Just age six, he's moving out of his mother's home to join his grandfather. At age 12, he was shipped off to an orphanage, was a good math student, poor in English, but he was competitive when it comes on to sports. He could run very fast and don't try to challenge him in fighting. He will knock you down. That was Billy Sunday. And so because of his competitive athletic um, um, prowess, he ended up being involved in baseball. In 1883, Billy went to major leagues. And thereafter, he became a legend. So he moved from little league and he was now involved in big league. And it was while he was involved in major league, he became a Christian because he saw a young lady that he liked. And the young lady was a Presbyterian and, and um, the girl's father never really liked him because he was a sportsman. He said, oh no, you're not qualified for my daughter. And so Billy Sunday was invited to the church. One of the team players said, listen, man, you can come to my church. I'll introduce you to my sister. And yes, it happened. And he started to put himself in line. So he became a Presbyterian preacher all because he liked the girl. So he became a Presbyterian Christian and then a preacher after marriage, Rashid. His children, after he was involved in ministry, were left with grandparents. No doubt I would want to think that this would have been the wife's side of family, knowing that Billy Sunday had serious challenges with his own grandfather from his mother's side. But the children were left because of the involvement of Billy Sunday along with his wife in ministry became so busy. So the children were left with grandparents. And when they got all the older in life, they were sent off to boarding school. And now you start thinking about parenting. A little further. He was a very busy man. So busy in the pulpit because he was an athletic kind of person. He was a baseball player. He knows how to run around the pitch. And he was an outstanding man. Now he became a preacher. He practiced the very same thing in the pulpit. And it is said that Billy Sunday would walk a mile back and forth in one sermon. Just imagine how energetic he was. He had big dreams to cover approximately 20% of the town's population wherever he preached. So he was very ambitious. So think about a Kingston or a Mandeville or a Trelawney or a Montego Bay, wherever you were from. He believed that if he got the opportunity to go into a city, he must baptize approximately 20% of the population. This man was on a mission. In Philadelphia, holding public campaign, up to 70,000 came out to listen to him preach. Now, you and I wouldn't mind if, if we can get this kind of audience with the three angels message to preach. 70,000. We have never seen anything like that until we have footprints of hope the other day. Media. In 1933, 
his oldest son by the name of Gregory. And I'm very happy as I welcome Dr. Gregory, my very, very good friend. I'm not talking about Dr. Gregory. You know, Dr. Gregory is my very good friend. I, I just learned uh, just, just Thursday, Dr. Gregory, that you're back with us. And I'm so pleased, no doubt I'll be calling you. You know, and so, and so Gregory attempted suicide. In 1929, he was arrested for auto theft and jump bail. This is Billy Sunderson. In 1930, he divorced. And in 1933, he jumped from a sixth floor window and sustained injuries, which cost him his life later. This is the son of a minister. His second son, Billy Jr., divorced in 1927. Remarried in 1928, just one year after divorce. He found somebody else and got married again. And divorced the following year in 1929 and at age 37. I'm talking about all this before it was, I mean, 37. Married two times, and he died sometime after at age 37 in an automobile wreck accident, and he died. Their third son, Paul, died at age 33. It was not a plane crash. He ran himself into bankruptcy and left his parents in financial problems because he wanted to be bailed out, but that's how the story of his life ended. And finally, his daughter was plagued by physical problems, succumbed to pneumonia and died at age 42. Billy Sunday had four children, four children. The year Billy Sunday's daughter died, it was the same year he had his first heart attack. So if he had his first heart attack, it means that he have had another heart attack. His first heart attack was while he was preaching but while the heart attack was attacking him, Billy Sunday continued to preach in the pulpit. And he told the congregation that I'd rather die on my feet than quit now. This man was so dedicated to ministry, so dedicated to preaching, and nothing is wrong with dedication. And two years later, he died from a heart attack at age 73. Shortly before his death, Billy wrote, I care not what is said about me. I am and will always be, will always have been plain Billy Sunday, trying to do God's will in preaching Jesus and him crucified and the risen from the dead for our sins. And this information I would have gotten from William Peterson. Um, 25 surprising marriage as he zoomed in on the family life of Billy Sunday. Beautiful copy. Um, see, I have a copy here I'll share with you. And um, it's a book you can invest in. Uh, here it is. Oh, da, 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 da. 25 surprising marriage. How could how great Christians um, struggle to make their marriage work? Beautiful book. But what really troubled me of all the great interests and the fascinating things in ministry about the life of Billy Sunday is that somewhere it is said that Billy Sunday once said, I have won the world, but I've lost my family. I have won the world. As a pastor, Family begins, your family begins the day you get married, the day you say, I do. And then the family extends when you decide to have children and the family becomes larger. But while you are busy engaged in ministry, teaching, preaching, visiting, administering, you should never forget the little flock. Don't become so busy that when they grow up, you become a stranger to them and they don't know you and you don't know them. And this statement I will never forget. I have won the world, but I've lost my family. I'm sure that all of us would love to see our children caught up along with the congregations 
that we are preaching to, the people in the community that we are seeking after to minister to. So how do we provide parenting while pastoring to our children? There is no one way. But there are quite a lot of things that we can learn. Now, I'm a parent and I'm a pastor. I have three boys and since last year, I have a niece that is now living with me. Um, uh, my niece just lost her, her daddy um, just last Thursday. Just last Thursday, my niece lost her daddy. And three years ago, 20 days, 19 days less, she would have lost her mommy, which is my sister. So both parents would have died in April just three years apart. And so from last year, she has been living with me so as I provide parenting. And so as I stop to think about the topic, I want us to understand that whatever happened to Billy Sunday can happen to all of us. Now, how to provide parenting to your children while pastoring and would have found some valuable information in the ministry magazine that I really like. Here are a few tips it puts. It said, put first things first. Schedule family time. Now, Billy Sunday's wife was someone who studied business. And she handled the business side of ministry. But as would have read that the children would have gone to grandparents, then boarding school, then they became adults, would have seen the end result. It appears as if they had no time for children. But in today's context as seven Adventist pastors and becoming pastors, it is very important that we find time for our children. If we don't find time for them, they will find time to do other things. Schedule time for them. Many pastors, kids. Uh, sort of trying to get all my style here. Many pastors kids per perceive that their pastor parent is often absent, unavailable. So therefore, make time for the people who are most important to you, according to Ministry Magazine, May 2017. When the Lord comes, while you are accountable for the congregation don't forget that you're also accountable to your children that is your little flock that is your first church your family you don't want to win the world but in the same stead you lose your family no you don't want that and if you're going to win them and if you're going to want them to be saved it involves time and the same time you pump into the effort of evangelism or pulpitarianism or whatever you name it counseling and visiting just as all those things take time you need to make sure that time is budgeted for your family especially your children when they are small it's one day if this world don't end we're going to reach retirement. But you can't retire from your family. You can't retire from your children. And if you don't have time for them, they will not have time for you. They're going to put you in a home. They're going to put you to somebody else that will take care of you. So the time to spend with them is now because they are getting older. I remember um, I... I, I I have this book that I find some wonderful stories. Um, it is Chicken Soup for the Christian Soul. And there was a cartoon there where there was a little boy. He was saying, Daddy, Daddy, can you come and play with me? I want to play baseball. And the father was saying, give me some time. Let me just finish reading the paper and then I will come. And the boy replied by saying, by the time you're ready, I'll be grown up. Unfortunately, some of these things can reach the pastor's family. So we have to put up some fences and guard. Now, number two, be one. And all these information... They are coming from Minister's Magazine, the 2017 edition in May. Be warned. You must be warm with your kids. Love them. Be loving. Be affectionate. And be authoritative. The result of the pastoral family stress study suggests that pastor's kids whose parents establish a warm, 
loving relationship with them, spend time with them, and are consistent in their spiritual will, more likely be really just the committed in adulthood. I hope you're following me. Based on the study, pastors, kids whose parents establish a warm, loving relationship with them, spending time with them, and are consistent in their spiritual spirituality will, will more likely be Real, um, um, really, really justly committed to adulthood. You and I don't want our children to leave the church. We have to get our kids, kids to be involved. Sometimes we are pastors with, with um, multiple congregations and we run from one congregation to another congregation and other kids are being involved and because we're so busy, they are not involved. And what some ministers do, some ministers would say, listen, family, we have to decide at which church we are going to go. I try that and I, I have difficulties because my kids want to go wherever I go. But I still remember training up a child in the way they're supposed to go. So when they get old, they will not depart from it. So I'm trying my best to see how best I can work this thing out. Because they don't want to stay anywhere. They want to come with me. And so whenever the opportunity arises, I try to get them to be involved. I try to spend time with them. You know, my son who is 12, he said to me the other day, we are planning to be on a mission project. And I said, the possibility lies that this, this mission project that we are going um, on, they may want to, to ask you to preach. And, um, you know, would you like to be involved? And he said to me, daddy, don't answer for me. Let them ask me, he's only 12. But he's basically saying, listen, I want to have an independent mind to make my contribution. Nothing is wrong with that in my thinking. I know he will not say no, but he's saying, don't answer for me when they ask if I can preach. Let them come to me and ask me. So let us love them. Let us be warm. Let us not be somebody else in the pulpit and a different person at home. Because your children know the real person that is in the pulpit. You can't fake it. You can fake it with the congregation, but you can't fake it with them. So we talk about authoritative parenting style. Doesn't mean the same thing as being authoritarian. The authoritative parenting style means one in which parents provide a warm, loving, nurturing environment where clear boundaries are established and open communication is encouraged. Now, this is not to be confused with authoritarian parenting style, which sets boundaries without warmth, where parents are strict and inflexible and have high expectation without providing support. As I said in my opening prayer, is that oftentimes you have to understand that the congregation of expectations from our children, and sometimes the expectation is higher and they're unfair, and sometimes they don't get the support that they ought to have out there. And that's why we have to reinforce them and support them. You know, my, my son, well, all my kids go to Sydney Adventist schools. And I remember a few years ago, Elder Cole, the church had wanted to invest my son, the bigger one. He was probably about seven or eight at that time to become a pathfinder. They used to have um, pathfinder against sabbath evenings and sometimes he would be there sometimes he would not be there as you know the family wants to be with me and investor service is coming up and they said pastor you know your son is ready for investor service and i said but i never see him as regularly as much as possible um in terms of the courses and what he was doing because i can't recall ever you know, came home and, and said they have given me some assignment about birds or amphibian or stars or nuts or fire building or you name it, because yes, I was a master guide myself. But I never, I can't recall him coming home with any assignment for me to assist him or to work with him. And um, others were going through. And I said, honestly, let me talk with him first. So I asked him what is pathfindering, because pathfindering is all about helping boys and girls to have a more committed relation with Jesus and get him, and he couldn't answer that. And my response to them was, listen, I wanna teach my children values that they should not get things that they did not work for. Because I don't want them to be invested when they were not properly prepared. We have to be careful as to how we develop characters in them because we know that 
pastors, kids are very special in the church. They will get special privileges and those kind of things. But I don't want mine to get special privileges that they don't deserve. And so even at school, I said, listen, not because they are mine. Treat them like normal, regular children as much as you can. Because I want them to understand that this is the real world. We must provide a safe environment for their spiritual struggle. Sometimes, not every time they like church. And they will tell you, my son said, Daddy, sometimes you preach too long. Do I try to be short? Today, after I finished preaching, and as soon as I came down, he took out the phone. I said, Daddy, I was timing you. 30 minutes. <laughs> I said, praise the Lord. I said, did I preach long? He said, no, Daddy, this is all right. Provide a safe haven for them. For their spiritual struggle. They, they, they all have some struggling. They are normal children like everybody else. But remember that this, that spiritual struggle comes as a normal process of faith. Just as though you have challenges sometimes, they have challenges sometimes too. And spiritual development takes place during adolescence and possibly earlier and their transition into early adulthood. So while you provide parenting, not because you're the pastor, don't think that because you preach, then they will automatically go spiritually. No, I've learned a passage in the scriptures where Paul says, from a child thou hast taught me the Holy Scriptures. So you and I as parents have to make sure we take time out to teach our children because I am firm of the belief that it's not because I'm in the pulpit, my children are going to be saved. No, they must have a reason for their faith. They must build a relation with God for themselves, not on my commitment to Christ. I'm winding down. Protect your children. Be sensitive to the pressure that are uniquely affecting your children. The past and spouse can protect their children in the congregation or other well-meaning into a set unreasonable expectations for them. You're a pastor, Pitney. You know, if you do this, you're not supposed to do that. And it appears as if other children can do it. No, we don't want our children to do wrong, but we want them to be reasonable. So how do we deal with this kind of situation when sometimes they are treated unreasonable? Well, brothers and sisters, I find this information very unique when I look in the minister's, um, uh, 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 minister's magazine. It says, pastors should defend their children. Should what? Defend their children when necessary and educate their parishioners on how to relate to their children, encouraging them to be more understanding of their children and, and family's life in, 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 in stained glass, fishbowl. Also, allow your kids to make mistakes. Use those mistakes as an opportunity to exhibit grace and forgiveness. Hopefully, the children will learn from their mistakes. Many years ago, when I was a, a teenager, I remember going to camp and I thought this pastor was unreasonable. His child fell down. And I remember because it was a pastor's child, rushed over to take up the child and the pastor said, uh-uh, let him get up by himself. And I thought that was unreasonable. But then the pastor got the opportunity to share the reason why he does that. He said, listen, I want my children to understand that wherever they fall, they must rise. And he said, he said, whenever his kids fall, he knows when they can get up and when they can't get up. He knows when to help them and when not to help them. And so one day the two kids were on the outside and they were playing and one fell down and was there. And the other little one said to the one who fell on, get up, rise from where you fall. Because what children are watching us and they're learning lessons from us. And sometimes they make mistakes, but we pray that they will learn from those mistakes. Pray for your kids. Pray for your kids. And again, I say pray for your kids and keep on praying for them. Parenting knows, known as a huge blessing comes with many challenges. We should approach it with humility and reverence to God for giving us the opportunity to prepare his children for the kingdom. One of the greatest gifts that God has blessed us with is children. Children are a blessing. They are described as a heritage in the book of Psalms. 
chapter 27. And we have a great responsibility to care for them because we want them to be saved in God's kingdom. And prayer cannot be too much. Pray for them in the morning. Pray for them in the evening. And I can tell you, you must pray for them where they can hear you praying for them. Not silently in your room. But pray for them and pray over their struggles and call them by name. And don't be afraid to say, well, Lord, this one sometimes gives trouble more than the other one. Help them to understand what you're praying for. Because sooner or later they may start praying and say, Lord, help me to overcome my struggles too. Because they are learning from you. Finally, in the book Child Guidance, Ellen White wrote, she says, build a fortification of prayer and faith around your children and exercise diligent watching they run to. You are not secure for a moment against the attacks of Satan. You have no time to rest from wretchful or watchful earnest labor. You should not sleep a moment at your post. Let me tell you, ministers, if there are any children that the devil loves, it's your children. He loves them faithfully. He don't want them to be saved. He don't want them to be an agent of change wherever they go. The devil wants them to fail. But when you present them to the Lord as parents and understanding their needs and, and meeting their needs and be a loving father and loving mother and be warm towards them and presenting Christ, there is no one way of parenting. And so, and so, and so you have to guard against and, and, and speak with your spouse. As I said, both of you are coming together as parents with two different parenting styles. And sometimes you can clash over parenting style as to what is supposed to be done and what should not be done. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord can guide you that you will both do what is right in the sight of God and for the growth and development of your children. So many more could have been said. We have been sitting here for quite some time. Young pastors, pastors in the making, thank you for having me. And may God bless you. And remember, don't be like Billy Sunday, who said, I've won the world. But I've lost my family. God bless you. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for that soul stirring presentation, Pastor Hilton. Uh, we have one question here for you. And the question says, a pastor who has a district, let's say of four churches, do you, do you recommend that they take the children to those four churches weekly as the pastor visits the churches? Or do you recommend that the pastor allows them to remain at one central church to be involved and to contribute to that particular church? One hat will not fit everybody. Because the truth be, you would not want, like in my setting, in my case, that if my children love to be around me and love to be with me, and I may bound them to be at a church, they may say, but the church have my daddy. Why can't I not have my daddy? And they can grow up and become so resentful of the place of worship that I could not have my daddy because the congregation have taken him away from me. So I share with you in recent times, as, as you would have seen in my profile there, just a few months ago, they have asked me to serve as executive secretary. And I started thinking about my kids. Lord, what's going to happen? I don't have a district as before. But, you know, I invest in a little thing they call a quiz master. Elder Cole is aware of that, a little device. It's sort of plug in. And you can set up questions and answer because my boys sort of love that kind of thing. And so one of my strategy is that whenever I'm going to go to a church, I'm willing to speak with the AY leader to say, listen, I'm coming in for the day, but I would love to do something in your church. And AY, so we have the, the youth ministers department that may carry the Bible champion. So ahead of time, set up the chapters that they're supposed to be reading and my boys will be reading. And then we, I create the question and the answer. And I said, I'm helping the youth ministers department. And we're going to be having a quiz this afternoon. Get them to be involved. 
well, not only for the youth champion segment of it, but also there's a heritage quiz that the minister the department that is responsible for studying the book of Revelation and church history. I want to give them these materials and say, listen, we're going to a, a church, we're up in Timbuktu, you know, but if you want to participate, you will have to start study too. So when mm -hmm. some evening come and send the information to AYL and say, I'm coming to your church, but you would have heard about the heritage quiz. Are you preparing? These are the information I wanted to get to young people and prepare them for. And we're going to set some question and introduce them as to what can happen when October comes. And that's just another way of getting them involved because, as I said, it is not one hat that fits all. Because I may say it may be best for you to stay at one church, but I'm all over the entire place. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, I wish I could be with my dad. So we have to find creative ways to see how we can work with them and don't neglect them and get them to be involved. As Pastor Chambers says, that's a very excellent response. We have some, some a flood of questions coming in while you're talking, Pastor Hilton. Another question is, how do you deal with children who choose to go astray or leave the church? It is very sad. A couple of weeks ago, Joel Duncan was ordained as an elder. And it was his father who escorted him down the aisle at his ordination. One of the greatest joy is to see when you have nurtured your children and they grew up in the church and they stayed in church. And here is Joel wanting to become a pastor. I I'm so proud. It breaks the heart when they depart from the faith and some depart from the faith for, me, for various reasons. While we minister to them, I cautioned us never to be spiritually abusive towards them. Because sometimes we can be spiritually abusive. We tell them about the law, but they have never experienced the grace of the law. What do we say to someone who has strayed away? Find out exactly what would have really broken that commitment and that love that they have with Jesus and, and to see how we can be there for them and to support them and to encourage them and you know constantly pray for them. It, I, I, there is no one answer, but we have to constantly pray for our children because the devil loves them. Very profound points. Uh, another question says, what are some of the measuring sticks that church members have for the pastor's children? And how do you think this affects the pastor's children? All right, so here you go. As I said earlier on in my presentation, because my son is coming from a pastor's home, so if they go to church and they ask him to do a, a devotion when they never appear in my head of time, he, he must do it because he's coming from a pastor's home. No, that is unfair. Give him time like any other child to be involved. Um, just as he told me, he said, Daddy, don't, don't answer for me. Let them ask me. And I have to learn to respect that. Sometimes... Sometimes, you know, um, um, I would have learned a few things and I'm going to share one of them with you. I would have learned from a senior pastor. He said, you know, as a pastor's wife, you don't have to sit at the front of the church every time. Sit at the back. Because when you sit at the back, you will hear some things that you will never hear if you sit at the front. And they're important to hear. Because sometimes the pastor making mistakes up there. And the people are grumbling down there. And they will always believe in their mind that you are up there. And they say some things. And they never remember that you're sitting beside them. I mean, they catch up and they say, oh, wow. <laughs> and so, because my kids were small, my wife never sat at the front. Because... Sometimes they want to be on the outside. They want fresh air. And sometimes it is, it is, it is unfair to them because sometimes they, their attention span is very short. And they may want to go on the outside. But walk from the front of the church may create some disturbance. And people say, well, Pastor Pete, every meeting one go to do a Pastor Pete, they buy that. But every children do that. That's why they have mother's room for churches. And so, and so, you know, if they are becoming unsettled or unruly, if you want to say, or, you know, um, um, becoming restless, you just slip at the back and you 
walk them on the outside and they get cool breeze and you know you take them back on the inside and 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 sometimes people will just think that as far as a picnic picnic bad but whatever children do it you know um talk with them at home talk with them at home um um you know yeah but but sometimes the measuring sticks they are they are they're they are unreasonable just as so pastors wives there's a book i have what what no one says to pastors why they have the expectations them things are because your part your spouse should be able to sing should be able to preach but, but, but god give different people different gifts that may not be your spouse gift so they must not be unreasonable <laughs> you know? amen and i think a follow-up question sometimes because of the unrealistic expectations pastor there might be a temptation to be extra tough on the children how do we as pastors resist that temptation to be extra strict with our children you know brethren be real with your kids parenting begins at home not at church and talk with them remind them about sabbath my 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 my, my, my smallest is three years old and i'm not saying that my family is the most perfect family but you know um his attention span is a little different from the bigger ones. And uh, um, there are some programs that you would be exposed to in the week, educational programs. Um, You'll be wondering, so what happens on a Sabbath is that he would want to be exposed. You know, so one day I saw him one Friday night and for some reason the phone got away in his hand and he found himself on YouTube and he said, oh, daddy, it is Sabbath. And uh, he said, he said, oh, daddy, it is Sabbath. It is VeggieTales. You must watch only VeggieTales. Now, for those of you who have kids and you ever come across VeggieTales, VeggieTales is a program for children. And so he knows that when Sabbath comes. So the point I'm making is that we must teach our children from home. Don't try to straighten them out because the brethren are watching. Sit down and talk with them at home. You know, teach them as to what is right. And so when they get out there, it now becomes easier for you and more relaxed. So you have to be telling them about stop doing this and stop doing that and 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 those you know kind of things. So 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 put some boundaries at home and talk with them and relate to them that they can understand and you'll have less stress when you go out with them. I've seen that and it has worked for me. Thank you very much for that response Pastor. And we have one more question and this question is saying should we make it our point of duty to let our children know that they are pastor's children or should we let them grow normally? <laughs> My kids are Carlington Hilton's children. Um, um, this is all before I got married. I would have said to my wife, what if I don't become a pastor one day? What would you do? I don't have to be a pastor all the days of my life. I'm grateful. I'm here because of the grace of God. But if you're going to be marrying to ministry because I'm in ministry, what will happen? God forbid, I'm not in ministry. So I want my kids to be real. They're living in a real world. They, 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 they are the parents of Carlington Hilton. Carlington Hilton is a pastor. I never said to my boys, you must become a pastor one day. Because I believe that pastoring is God's calling, not me. But it would be a wonderful thing if they choose to become a pastor. But just as God called me, he can call them. But if the Lord don't call them to that kind of profession, they need to understand that, listen, you're a Christian. One of them wants to become a pilot. I don't know if his mind may change. But ever since he said, he, he, he said, Daddy, I want to become a pastor. I said, no big deal. But one thing you need to remember, there are some people in some profession that pastors will never reach. But if you have to be the one to reach them up in the air, make sure that you do what God asks you to do. That's the kind of relationship I have with them. That's the kind of reasoning and conversation I have with them. Wherever you go, you are a disciple. Because everything else in this world, one day we will become meaningless. Or whatever you can do for God, do it for God. Because some of our campaigns, a pilot may never come. An engineer may never come. Many of us don't know them. But if that is your profession, don't go in there for money. But go in there 
to serve and to reach people for Jesus. Amen. Pastor Hilton, we just like to really thank you on behalf of the Ministerial Association and the wider School of Religion and Theology. We'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us this afternoon. I, I can speak for myself when I can say that my soul was stirred, and I know that that would have been true for my fellow colleagues as well, the fellow ministerial students, and all those who are watching the faculty and all those who are watching this as well. I think you have shared very relevant points so that we can avoid be ending up in Billy Sunday situation to say that we have won the whole world but have lost our family. We thank you so much, sir, and may God continue to bless you and bless your family as you continue to do an outstanding job for the ministry, even as you treat your family as your first church. Thank, thank you so you much, much and God bless you. God bless you, sir. Right, so I'm just joining in with um, Member Raheem in sending special thanks to Pastor Kilton for a timely presentation. Uh, though I'm not here at this time, but of course I would have garnered gems that will help me in the future, you know, God's willing. Right, so. Thank you again uh, very much, Pastor. And God's blessings upon you and your ministry. And, um, you know, definitely we will keep it as well. And such as cool. So thank, thank you sir. again. And we'll transition um, even into our service. Thank you.
His words liberate. Imagine living in a world where there's nothing but frogs. Imagine going to your kitchen and there's nothing but frogs. Imagine going to your living room to watch your favorite program and there's nothing but frogs. Imagine going to your bathroom and there's nothing but frogs. Imagine going to your bedroom and there's nothing but frogs. Well, such was the case of the mighty man Pharaoh. Mm, the word of God came unto Moses, saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. Hmm. But Pharaoh refused to do this. And after refusing and refusing, Pharaoh rec recognized that there's nothing that he could do to get rid of the frogs. In verse 9 of Exodus chapter 8, we find Pharaoh saying to Moses, plead for me, entreating Moses to help him to get rid of the frogs. And Moses saying to Pharaoh, well, the ball is within your court. And when Pharaoh recognized that he will have to let Israel go, Pharaoh said, tomorrow. By saying tomorrow, Pharaoh was basically saying, I'll spend another night with the frogs. Hmm, we too are sometimes like Pharaoh when it comes to sin. We refuse to give up, simply to say that, hmm, when I graduate, maybe when I get that husband, maybe when I get that wife, hmm, but whatever that is stopping us from giving up to come to Jesus, we will eventually lose it. Hmm. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15 that, that see this day I have put before you life and death. And verse 19, the clincher, hmm, choose life that thou may live. Brethren, I say to you that everlasting peace, everlasting joy can only be found in Jesus. For the word of God liberates. Greetings and good evening, everyone. All right, it's now time for our Vespa service, song service. This song service. Right. Good evening, everyone. At this time, we will be doing our song service for the talk. Feel free to sing along sing. as we go through this song service together. And the first song that I will be singing this evening, as the Sabbath comes to a close, is M five one six. All the way, my Savior leads me. All right. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who true life has been my guide? Every peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know what er befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know what er befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, chairs each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be gushing from the rock before me lo a spring of joy i see gushing from the rock before me lo a spring of joy i 
see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When I wake to life immortal, wing my fly to rents of day. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Amen. All right. So the second song, song that we will be using is in 515, The Lord is My Light. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light, then why should I fear? By day and by night, his presence is near. He is my salvation from sorrow and sin. This blessed persuasion the Spirit brings in. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. The Lord is my light, the clouds may arise. Faith stronger than sight looks up to the skies. Where Jesus forever in glory doth reign, then how oh, can I ever in darkness remain? The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night he leads me along. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night. He leads me along. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my strength. I know in his might I'll conquer at length. My weakness in mercy he covers with power. And walking by faith he opposes me each hour. The Lord is my light my strength my joy and my song by day and by night he leads me along the lord is my light my joy and my song by day and by night he leads me along the lord is my light my all and in all there is in his sight no darkness at all. He is my Redeemer, my Savior and King. With saints and with angels, his praises I sing. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. By day and by night, he leads me along. The Lord is my light my joy and my song by day and by night he leads me along amen all right at this time we will sing our last song for this evening our final song and it is m 318 whiter than snow Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. 
Lord Jesus, look down from thy throne in the sky and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for, Lord Jesus, for this, I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. The last verse, no? Lord Jesus, thou see, yes, I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Amen. Thank you very much for singing along with me. Amen, amen. Greetings, everyone. Today's reading comes to us from the book Reflecting in Christ. Christ. Be filled with all the fullness of God, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that he, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ. Here are revealed the heights of attainment that we may reach through faith in the promises of our Heavenly Father when we fulfill his requirements. Through the merits of Christ, we have access to the throne of the infinite power. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us our things? Romans 8.32 the Father gave his spirit without measure to his Son, and we also may partake of its fullness. Through Jesus, the fallen son of Adam become sons of God, both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. The Christian life should be one of faith, of victory, and joy in God. Truly spoke God's servant, Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8, verse 10. And Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus concerning you. It is only as the law of God is restored to its rightful position that there can be a revival of primitive godliness and faith among God's professed people. Amen. Amen. We thank Lafayette Clark for doing that reading for us. Um, this afternoon, we also thank Michael Morris for doing that lovely service. At this time, we're going to have a prayer song 
by Sister Jovelyn Sergil, after which we will have a special prayer. And I'm going to ask Minister Marvin Price online if he could do that special prayer for us. So we're going to have a prayer song by Sister Jovelyn Sergil, after which we're going to have our Minister Marvin Price doing a special prayer for us. Thank you. We're going to sing um, the choir chorus. We swear a prayer in the morning. We swear a prayer at noon. We swear a in the evening. All right, realized we're having some technical issues right there with Jubilant Sergil. So I'll just complete the song. Whisper a prayer in the morning. Whisper a prayer at noon. Whisper a prayer in the evening. So keep your hearts in tune. Jesus may come in the morning. Jesus may come at noon. Jesus may come in the evening. So keep your hearts in tune. At this time, we'll have the prayer by Marvin Price. Good afternoon, everyone. Let us pray. Shall we pray? Father, we want to give you thanks for your divine love mercies towards us we want to give you thanks lord for the sour and for your many blessings that you have been bestowing upon us from morning until now truly lord we are refreshed to be in your presence today and in your presence we are happy that there is still fullness of joy and at your right hand we are still experiencing pleasures forevermore in a special way, Lord, as we would have set aside this time to seek you and to hear from your many servants that you have equipped here with us over the this weekend as to how we can be better grounded in the call to which you have called us. We ask of thee, Lord, even now, that for each worshiper, each one who would have shared in some aspect of this weekend that you will anoint us with the anointing of your spirit grant us lord not just the ability to hear but that to act upon the instruction the information that you have shared with us father we pray that as you prepared us as men to go out there in the ministry that lord we will seek to avail ourselves to you in such a way that the work to which you have called us to do will be accomplished. Your name will be glorified and we will be drawn closer to your soon coming. Continue, Lord, to direct us as your children. And may when time on earth would have come to its end and eternity shall have put in its appearing, may it be there, Lord, that it will be our joy and delight to know that we are going home to be with you 
our God and King. Continue to lead, guide, and instruct in what I fail to ask of thee. I pray that thou in thine infinite mercies and wisdom will grant unto us as your children. As you see fit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Marvin, for, for that, that lovely, lovely prayer. prayer. At this time uh, is our testimony segment, and uh, I would like to share a special testimony that I do believe will bless our hearts this afternoon. My testimony this afternoon is very simple, and it shows how mighty our God is. It was last summer I was in Montego Bay canvassing uh, at a particular location they call Witter Village. And for those who are canvassers who are from Montego Bay or who have canvassed in Montego Bay before, you would understand that Witter Village is a place that accommodates tourists. And so it's a very fruitful area. And I was located there for the summer doing some canvassing. And out of nowhere, I got sick where I could not canvas anymore. Uh, but before I got sick, God would have made preparation for my tuition. You didn't hear me. I said, before I got sick, God would have made preparation for my tuition. I met one lady while canvassing before getting sick. And that, that lady would have purchased a set of books from me and I would have taken her number. She's from Canada. She was visiting in Jamaica at the time. She's also a Seventh-day Adventist. And you know, I was standing outside the store and as she walked out, uh, we greeted each other and I did not even have to give her a sales script because she saw a particular group of books in my hand and she wanted to get those books uh, in my backyard and some other, some other books. And to my surprise, she took all the books. We exchanged number and we have been friends ever since. Because of my sickness, I was not able to complete my, my canvassing for the summer. But can I tell you friends that for this semester, the commencing of spring semester, that one customer that I would have met through canvassing decided to cover my entire tuition for the semester. You didn't hear me. I said that one customer that I met during the summer cover my entire tuition for the semester. And that goes to, show, goes to show that we serve a God who is right on time. We may not be able to trace his hands, but we can rest assured that we can trust his heart. And I'm confident, my friends, that the same God that supply my needs is the same God that is able to supply your needs. I don't know what this summer will bring, but I'm confident that my God has everything in control. I don't know where fall semester fee is coming from, but I know I serve a God who is able. The same God who parted that Red Sea is the same God who is able to cover our finances and every single challenge that we have we can rest it at his feet because he will care for us. I trust and hope that as we go throughout this Vespa series, these, this Vespa series during this refresh, that we will find confidence in our God because he's still able to do far beyond we could ever ask or think. At this time, we're going to have the song of meditation being done by our dear sister. She was having some technical issues, but I'm sure those issues would have been rectified. So I'm going to turn over now to Sister Juvelin Sergil as she gives us that meditation song. Over to you, Sister Sergil. All right, thank you, Brother Zigayu. Um, this song that I'm going to sing is one of my favorites. I hope that you are blessed by it. 
Hosola you we we at your No light in the darkness you see. There's light for look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth with was strangely deep. In the lights of his glory. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of heart will strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory Amen. 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 Thank you so much. We anticipated one singer, but we got two. God supply a backup and how melodious they sing together. Thank you so much, Sister Sir Jill and Sister Curlin Francis. We thank you for that lovely song and may God bless your singing ministry richly. Uh, the privilege is mine this afternoon to introduce to you our Vesper speaker for this afternoon. The speaker hails from the parish of St. Mary, and he is a third year student in the School of Religion and Theology. He's one who is very humble, He's one who is very friendly, very social. Every person gets along with this individual. He's a young man who is passionate about the ministry. He's my good friend and my brother. I did say my good friend and my brother. We have been friends for the past three years. And I've learned so much from this individual. And he's very dear to my heart as a friend. And I know that he has a word for us this afternoon. I speak of God's manservant, C. Andre Graham, who will bless our heart with the Vesper charge this afternoon. I crave for him your undivided attention. And as he is filled with the Holy Spirit this afternoon, and as the word that will be uttered from his lips reach your ears, may your hearts be blessed. And may you submit to the calling or the heeding of the Holy Spirit. Hear he the man of God, see Andre Graham, as he bless our hearts. Amen, amen. I thank you so much for those words of introduction, Mr. Richard's brother, Richard's big brother, Ziggy. I it has truly been a blessing. This friendship 
has been a blessing. The university city experience has been a blessing. And truly, this refresh has been a blessing. Let me take this opportunity to extend greetings and welcome to all those who are actually here on this platform this evening. It's truly a blessing to kick back and really feel the refreshing pull of our Lord and Savior in our lives amidst our busy schedule as ministers and ministers in training. And who knows, you might have some visitors on the various platforms. But even this evening, as we seek to press forward and respect time, the scripture reading this evening comes to us from the book of John. That's the Gospel of John, John chapter 15. We're going to be starting, we're going to be looking at a few verses, verses 4 through to 6. That's John 15, verses 4 through to 6. And it tells us, reading from the King James Version, it tells us, Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can he except he abide in me. And the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Bear with me as I speak to you under the caption this is crop production. Crop production. Let us pray. Dear God of heaven, your servant is calling upon your high glory. Dear Lord, we are praying and we are asking for a message from you. We are praying that our hearts will be blessed. We are praying that our souls will be stirred within us. I recognize even at this moment, O oh Lord, if it is not for you, there is nothing that I can do to bring glory to your name. And so even now, God, I pray that you will use me beautiful. You will use me magnificent, O oh God. And may this vesper charge be a blessing to all those who are in here. So even though God made the words of my mouth, may the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh God, my strength, my redeemer. Amen. Crop production, crop production. Plants are beautiful aspects of creation. I don't know about any of us here this evening, but it gives a refreshing. Yes, I believe I am allowed to use that word this afternoon. It gives me a refreshing feeling when I get to walk and soak up the wonders of nature. It brings me a warm feeling inside, a relaxing sensation when I am able to walk in the morning and the dews are still, the dew drops are still on the plant leaves and we can see the gleams of the golden sunshine being reflected from these droplets. It gives a marvelous appearance. It, it reminds us that our creator is one who is appreciative of beauty. It reminds us that we have a creator who is interested in beautiful things. And it is for that reason why he made you and I, yes, everyone, on the platform, he made us beautifully. But, but, but the caption is crop production, not beauty. It's crop production. I'm going somewhere this afternoon. But you see, plants, plants are interesting things. Plants are interesting creator, creations. We, we recognize that the God that we serve is a marvelous and wonderful creator. At surface glance we recognize that the precious pearls the diamonds the ruby the emerald the, the the various aspects of creation whether it is organic or inorganic whether it is plant or animal whether it is a celestial body or a body of water we realize we realize that it was carefully and wonderfully made 
Now, as if the beauty of these created aspects, as if the beauty of these created elements aren't enough, isn't enough to, to, to bring about a awe within our mind or to blow our minds completely, when we pull out a microscope and we begin to look at these things, the tiny little pieces, the tiny tissues that make up these things, our minds are, are blown even further. Yes, I believe that even if a tiny piece was left in our minds, when we begin to take a closer look at what God would have created, we see where indeed God is an awesome God. So when we take a closer look at the plant, we get an idea of how it works. You see, the plants, it's filled with vessels and tiny molecules and all manner of pieces that come together to form what we see as a huge tree or a little seed. And now we're going to pay attention to a few of these in light of the scripture reading, in light of what Jesus would have presented to the people. So you have the plant, it has the root system and the shoot system. The root system is what is normally underground and the shoot system is what we normally see. We see the leaves, we see the stem, we see the flowers, we see the fruits underneath the ground is where all this fancy work takes place. The roots, they go down deep and they spread wide. It keeps the plant anchored in the soil. It, it, it causes the plant to be able to endure strong winds. It, it keeps the soil together. The roots of the plant serve such a beautiful function. We, we were still on point even now. The shoot system, Apart from the beauty that it, it provides, we know that through the process of photosynthesis where it makes use of water, carbon dioxide, in the presence of sunlight, we see where it produces oxygen and sugar for the plant. Now, in order for things to flow all the way through the plant, they have these two vessels. You have the xylem and the phloem vessel. One transports water and one transport sugar. Now, when you look through the plant, you see where every single thing is connected. The root system is connected to the shoot system, and we see where the stems are connected to the branches, and the leaves are connected, and the roots are connected. Everything seems to be connected. Now, Jesus paints a beautiful picture when he says that when he invites us to abide in him, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine, no more can he except he abide in me. What can we learn from the plant? Lesson number one, everything is connected. Anything that seeks to function independently of the rest of the plant will die. The leaf that is idly plucked from the tree by a child passing by, we see where over time it turns yellow, then it turns brown, then it turns black, it becomes dead. So is the believer who isolates himself from a loving savior who allows for sustenance to flow in the believer's life. It doesn't stop there, it doesn't stop there. We, we, we are going somewhere this evening. When we look at the plant, we realize that everything needs to be connected in order, in order for it to thrive. Now, permit me, if you will, to introduce you to this big, fancy word, a word, that, a phrase, rather, that I'd call artificial vegetative propagation. Now, it sounds quite big and hard to understand, but that's just a fancy way of saying reproducing plants in an artificial manner. The question that many persons may be posing even at this moment, why would we need to reproduce plants artificially? We know that they were created by an awesome creator, and surely he would have designed a mechanism within them for them to reproduce. Plants, unlike human beings, are asexual, meaning that they produce both reproductive organs. And so we have the anther with the pollen grains, and of course we have the style, the stigma, and the ovum, which later develops into a fruit. What, where's the preacher going to keep with this this afternoon? Though the plant produces or, or, or contains both reproductive system and depends on the wind and the bees and other, and other elements of nature, 
to reproduce, we see where there are moments when it needs a bit of assistance. For example, in the event of a unnatural phenomena like a disease that plagues plants and kills majority of the population. In times like these, what the farmer has to do is resort to other means to preserve what is left of that plant species. So for example, you have a orange peel and it becomes infected with this pest or with this fungus and it is dying at a rapid rate. Does this sound familiar? Do we have a organism or a, a group of people or created beings that are plagued with this unnatural element or entity, which if it is not addressed or if it is that a rescue plan is not in effect, we see where the entire population will be wiped out. And so what the plant does, he walks over and he explores one of the many means by which the plant can be reproduced artificially. You have ear lane, you have mark cutting, you have budding, you have grafting. I'd like to use the phrase grafting because we see it coming out very often in scripture. We see it happening very often in scripture. Grafting is a process by which we take one plant from a similar family and place it into another plant for it to grow and bear fruits. I'm getting somewhere here. So, so the infected plant, the plant that has been infected, if by chance you are able to see just this one branch that has not been affected by this unnatural element, this disease or this pest, there is hope for that plant to survive. And so you get your knife and you make a cut on that plant. After you would have removed that plant, that plant needs to be connected to a source in order for it to thrive. If it is not connected, we see where it will turn yellow, then brown, then black, and then dead. And so to save the life of this plant, we need to connect it to something that is pumping some amount of nutrients into that plant so that no, it will not only live, but it will blossom and bear fruits. And so you make a cut on the, uh, on the other plant or the post plant, as I'd like to call it. And so when you would have made both cuts, you make a V cut on the plant that will receive the branch. When you would have stripped off the outer bark of that plant, you will strip off a portion of the outer bark of that plant that you are trying to save. And you see the outer bark is a bit tough. It hinders the process of the nutrients flowing into that plant. It hinders the connection process. Hello, does that remind us of something that the believer at times holds on to in his life? When we talk about pride, when we talk about ego, it, it stops the blessing, it stops the sustenance, it stops the way in which God wants to come through for you and I. We have to like the farmer strip away from pride. We've got to strip away the ego. We've got to lay ourselves bare so that God can make that connection that will save our lives from that unnatural entity that I would like to call sin. And so after the connection would have been made to that host plant, we see where the farmer pulls for another item that I call the budding tape. You see that tape is there for a very specific reason. I'd like to compare the budding tape to the love of Christ. The budding tape is what is wrapped around the union of both plants. After both plants would have been united, we need to keep out unwanted elements. We need to protect it from the intense rainfall. We need to protect it from the intense sunlight. And of course, we need to keep it firmly secured into the slot that it has been placed. And the love of Christ is what keeps us connected to him. His goodness, as one songwriter would put it, keeps running after us, even when sometimes we are quite stubborn, even when sometimes we are running in the opposite direction. Don't believe for a moment 
that you can outrun the love of Jesus. We're talking about a one who saw it, not robbery, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He came down to live among us. He came down to teach us, to re-educate us of the way to godliness, to show us that indeed there's a God in heaven who loves us with an everlasting love. He lived among us. He died for us. He's risen and he's interceding for us. His love is like a budding tape that keeps the union strong. And so when that plant is up the host plant, we see where nutrients begin to flow into that plant that would have been rescued. Does this speak to someone here today? Was someone living in a particular environment that is plagued? Was someone living in an a, in a environment that, that seems as if they could not survive the various unnatural elements that seek to stifle their progress? Might I suggest to someone that the Lord is able to reach out and rescue you? As he would have proclaimed about Zachariah, where he, he, he would have spoken of him as a branch that was plucked out, or a brand rather, that would have been plucked out of the fire. He can do the same for you and I. He can remove you from your toxic circumstances. And when he removes you, he doesn't leave you to die. Rather, he hooks you up on life support. And when he hooks you up on life support, he wraps you around and around with cards of love that cannot be broken. And so when he hooks you up to the parent plant, we see where nutrients begin to flow into the believer. And so now we begin to understand what Jesus was saying where he was going when he encouraged the believer to abide in him, in verse 1, he would have started out by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he take it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So we see where even though some might be connected to the host plant, there are those unproductive branches. We see where there are some of them that produce no food, even though they would have been rescued, even though they would have been wrapped in, 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 in cards of love, still they produce no food. And it tells us that these individuals are these fruitless branches will be cast into fire. But in order for the individual or in order for the branch to bear much food, pruning needs to take place. Pruning is something that needs to take place in that there are unwanted elements in the life of the believer that needs to be removed. But biting needs to be removed. The politics, the ungodly politics, might I put it that way, needs to be removed. Removed so that an individual can remain connected with every other branch that is connected to the true vine. Because you see, we are not the only ones that have been rescued. It's a large rescue plan to rescue as many plants as possible. You and I are but just pieces, but just branches of rescued plants. And a part of being productive, a part of bearing much fruit is remain in connection or remain connected with the entire plant. And so much bearing, we are required, we are expected to bear much fruit after we would have received such tender love and care from our Lord and Savior. As I seek to wrap up, as I seek to wrap up the remaining verses that were read for the opening scripture, it says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him the same bring it forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them 
we cast them into the fire and they are burned. You see, apart of bearing much fruit, we are expected to bear much fruit in, in, in regards to what God has called us to do. If we are soaking up the blessings which are being transported into us as members of the entire plan, it's expected for us to bear fruits. Why do we need to bear fruits? It's through the bearing of fruits that plants reproduce. It is through the bearing of fruit that the entire population is not wiped out. We're expected to bear fruits and to testify and to witness based on the gift that we would have received through the Holy Spirit. But maybe the fruit that you're expected to bear is teaching. Maybe it is preaching. And yes, praise God, I was informed that there is even the gift of scholarship oh yes there are many 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 gifts out here so if it is that we're not bearing then something is wrong and so beloved beloved in harmony with the theme that we're operating under stay connected with christ stay grounded stay connected with each member as we seek to be refreshed as we seek to be refreshed like the plant the only way for it to experience refreshing, you see, when the sun gets hot, when the day gets hot and the temperature increases, it goes through a process that we call transpiration. It releases water, water vapor that aids in the cooling down process of the plant. That is a part of bearing much fruit. While we embark on our busy days, while we seek God's work while we press on seeking to be the best that we can, a crucial aspect of that is taking rest. Let the plant that signals when it needs to be refreshed, our bodies do tell us of it. And our loving Creator expects for us to rest, to take time to be refreshed. He invites us to come to Him, those who are weak and heavy laden, and He will give us rest. And so beloved, this evening, I encourage us, I encourage us to be connected to Christ, abide in him as he seeks to abide in us, that we may bear much fruit for the great harvest, which we're expecting to see when our Lord and Savior puts in his appearance, for all is good and faithful to Do you want to be a part of those plants that are rescued from that unnatural entity called sin? If that, is your, if, that is, if that is your desire, if that is your desire, I invite you even now, if there's someone paying attention online who wants for someone to even reach out to them, that is possible. You can just place in the chat, I. And for each and every single one of us here on this platform who feels as if the world is crumbling down because you're overwhelmed with all that's happening all around you. Our loving creator, he understands, he identifies with us. And so it is for that reason that at this moment, I invite us to bow our heads as I reach out to him, asking for him to be with us, bless us, and to refresh us even on our journey as his precious children. Let us pray. Dear God of heaven, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the reminder of how important it is to remain connected with you to abide in you always. And so even now, oh God, I pray and ask that you do this. Bless us. Many of your children at this moment, young, old, are in need of rest, sweet quality rest that eight hours in the night is unable to give, but rest that only you, oh Lord, only a loving creator is able to give unto his precious creation. So that's our asking, that's our plea. Keep us strong. Keep us safe. Refresh us even now, is my friend asking. May we all be found faithful, very much fruit on that day when you return to take us home. This is my friend asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a word. What a word.
we thank Minister CNJ Graham for allowing the Spirit of God to use you mightily. And if there is ever a time when we need to be connected, I believe the time is now. With that being said, we're going to sing our closing song, after which I will pray. So turn your hymnals to hymn number 50, and that is Abide With Me. That's hymn number 50, Abide With Me. I'll sing it in your hearing while you sing with your microphones mute. Abide with me, fast for the evening tide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When others' helpers fail and comfort flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. Swift to its close, heaps out life's little day. Earth's joy grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay, in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. I need thy presence, every passing o'er. What but thy grace can for the tempest pour? Who light thyself, my God and stain can be? Thou through clouds and sunshine, O oh, abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. I'll have to wait and there's no bitterness. Where is that sting? Grave, where's thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Let us pray, loving Lord and our eternal Father. We thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercies. We thank you, Lord, for the time spent in your courts this afternoon. We pray, Lord, that you will live out your life within us. Touch us by your grace. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, and by the power of your forgiving grace, transform us and help us to be refreshed, not just for time, but for eternity, as we tell you thanks in Jesus' name. At this time, we will now turn over to Elder Keith Cole, who will give us our vote of thanks. Over to you, Mr. Cole. God bless you, everyone. Amen and amen. Truly, that was a wonderful message. We want to thank C. Andre for allowing the Lord to use him to bring out that beautiful illustration, one that we can all identify with, one that we can truly see how God wants us to be connected to him so that we can fulfill the purpose of bearing fruit in this world. Now, the task has been given to me to offer the vote of thanks for such a wonderful refresh. Now, we started last night and we are here at the very end. My soul has truly been refreshed and, refreshed. and I know many of us can attest to the fact that we have been revived, we have been refreshed over this weekend. Now, on behalf of the Ministerial Association, our advisor, Pastor Chambers, the President, Roger Williams, and all the executive members, also would like to thank the School of Religion and Theology for assisting us coming on board and guiding us along the process. Also would like to thank the university administration from the president and all his vice presidents and all the, the members, faculty and staff of Northern Caribbean University. Want to say a special thank you to our presenters. Last night we had pastors Nevins, Richards and Walker who 
basically guided us through our theme for this weekend and they anchored the message and brought out the spiritual aspects that we can all take comfort and hope in. I want to thank all those who participated last night, all our participants from for Vesper service, also this morning for our Sabbath school program. I want to thank Ella Beckford and his team. Also would like to thank Dr. Gregory for giving that wonderful presentation regarding time management. Anyhow, and I, I must confess here, I'm sitting in one of his classes and I see Byron Anglin online. If one person comes to class and Doc is there, he's going to start. So Doc, Dr. Gregory is a man who lives by his principles. And I think that his presentation this morning is gave some practical tips that we can follow to be good stewards of time as we seek to go out and to be fruitful in this world. During our divine service, we want to thank all our participants as well and our main speaker, Dr. Leonard Johnson, for that wonderful presentation. I was blessed and I know all of us who were there for this morning service were blessed as well. I want to thank our afternoon presenters, Dr. Roy Dennis, Mrs. Orchid Smith and Pastor Carlington Hilton for touching on topics that are often overlooked as we seek to prepare ourselves for ministry. They gave wonderful, wonderful presentations, gave valuable tips that we can follow, and we were all blessed as a result. I want to thank you all for joining with us. And as we wind down, I pray that you will continue to support the Ministerial Association as we seek to advance the cause of God in this world. Amen. Moses led God's children Forty years he led them through The cold and through the night Though they said let's turn back Moses said keep going With Canaan land is just inside there will be no sorrow there in that tomorrow we will be there by and by milk and honey flowing there is where Give up the 